I actually got quoted about Man of Steel in this. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> and like when I was first scanning through, I uh, I was like, please don't let this be my only line. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, I really don't want, like, the Snyder Bros to be, like, on me about that shit. Um, that says a lot when it's, like, the, the Snyder Bros. Like, I hope the Snyder Bros don't say it. Like, the fact that we treat them like they're criminals that we want to avoid, that's, that kind of speaks volumes to the... <laughs> Welcome back to the Men of Steel podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I'm joined by my host, J. Mike Folson. Hey, everybody. Glad to have you back. And coming over from the Jaguar Sharks universe of <laughs> Montresor medium universe of, of shows, we've got Jesse Fresco. Hello. I'm here. Yes. Let's talk about this <laughs> wonderful, wonderful piece of cinema. <laughs> yeah. So since I, it's a podcast, you probably looked at the title of the episode. We are finally actually talking about Man of Steel. Percy Case. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's cool. So uh, for people who are familiar with the origins of the show, we had a originally anticipated doing an episode of Another Pass on this movie as a soft pilot and then launch the show. But then because of scheduling reasons, we ended up putting out the first couple episodes of Men of Steel before that episode dropped, uh, mostly just so we could be relevant to a couple of like movies that came out like Shazam, uh, the original one, I mean. So that episode does exist, and J. Mike and I do have a pretty good conversation about what we would have done differently. And Jesse, you and I were recently talking about the Planet of the Apes franchise over on your show, and afterwards, we were talking about Superman movies and Man of Steel and so forth, and I went back and checked out your episode of Film Rescue, which is a very similar format to Another Pass. And so I'm going to say that the audience, if they want to know what we would have done differently— uh, we all have gone in great detail about this, and I will have the episode <laughs> links in the show notes, so please check those out. But today I want this to be more of a freeform kind of like, oh, what actually works in this movie? What doesn't work? And, you know, yeah. what's, the, what's the culture of it? Like, it's uh, been several years for all of us since we did those particular episodes. So, like, where are things now, considering that, like, the Snyderverse is dead? God. <laughs> Quote, unquote, dead? <laughs> eh. Yeah, Aquaman 2 still has to come out, so I don't even know where that fits. So who can really say at this point? But like the <laughs> the momentum of the franchise is, is no longer there. Yeah. Although the fans will still not shut up about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to note that I actually also got referenced in the new book Voices from Krypton, which is an oral history of Superman for a lot of things. But one of the sections that I got quoted on was talking about Man of Steel. And when I was like first flipping through the book to see like where I got referenced, I was like, oh, please, God, don't let it be the one quote about like the nature of Man of Steel and Snyder Bros. And <laughs> all that, but, like, please, well, please don't let me just like paint a target on my back. Yeah, what was it? All right. So here's my uh, my quote there. My biggest problem with the Snyder movies was they rushed into we can't trust Superman. So let's get Batman to fight him. And then suddenly the world loves Superman after he's dead. It's like, wait a minute. What? I, I think we missed a Man of Steel 2 where he's actually the good hero. The movie didn't do quite as well as they wanted. So they course corrected by trying to appeal too much to iconography that people responded to, like putting Batman in there because Batman movies sell. As a result, it felt like a rush project, whereas it could have spent a little more time with Superman proving that he is Superman. It would have felt better to the folks who reacted negatively to it. The Snyder fandom online is frustrating because you can't have mixed feelings about those properties. As a result, you either love it or you hate it. And I'm like, I like Man of Steel fine. I thought it was a fine movie. I thought Cavill was a good Superman. I think the Smallville fight in Act 2 is better than the third act fight in Metropolis. If you had a strong sequel immediately coming after that, people would look back on it and be like, it was a good movie. Eh. And I wanted to read that quote because that is actually my general sentiment about this movie. I think that the movie has a ton of problems. It also has some cool stuff. And if you think about the time of when it came out, there was like a lot of like enthusiasm for superhero movies like the Marvel. Well, the Avengers had come out one year earlier. So everyone was like, oh, yeah, this is what we got to do. 
Right. And this had been in the works before and people were excited mm-hmm. about that and people were excited to see a good Superman movie. We hadn't I mean, we hadn't had a Superman movie since Superman Returns at this point, which had been several years. That movie itself felt kind of defanged from what it could have been because it was so slavish to the Chris Reeve movies, as well as, you know, Dalker Superman. Right. Yeah. And, and and like and then going back to all of like the Superman, like, you know, pr- prior to that, Superman four <laughs> was the previous Superman movie. So like the enthusiasm I've always kind of had Superman existing in some form or another, like not just in film, but also in television, because we also yeah. had Smallville. And then you also had him now in the Superman and Lois TV show on the CW, which is slowly wrapping up like he's very rarely ever been off season <laughs> yes but, always kind of somewhere but the movie part of it was the exciting part there because like you're you're absolutely right like right after superman 4 there's lois and clark the new adventures of superman then there's the animated series that, that bleeds into the justice league and all all that franchise mm-hmm. of, of like the dini verse and then yeah again you mentioned smallville and S- smallville we definitely need to call, talk about at some point on the show oh, because i actually never watched smallville i've seen like clips and i'm like eh, it's not for me it you know? ran too long, but it, it there, really there was did. a lot to say that was good about it. I, I really enjoyed a lot of it. TV shows that have like, was it 26 episodes a season? I'm just like, no, I'm just I don't have time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just no, I can't. I can't yeah. do it. That's why I don't watch a lot of anime. Anime is like what, like 30 episodes a season. Fuck off. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> Yeah, like when the Abridged series was still like a massive project to uh, like investment of time to watch. Like, you know, yeah. it's probably too big of a thing. <laughs> Abridged series as in, oh, now we're going to f- do 40 episodes as opposed to 80. Oh, <laughs> right. God, what the hell? <laughs> But yeah, like like there was a lot of enthusiasm because like superhero movies were all of a sudden being done right. Like none of us could have seen the Avengers coming prior to Iron Man 1. <laughs> I mean, even that phase one of Marvel was kind of like it's had some stumbling blocks going back and looking at it now. It's like, eh, oh, Captain yeah, America, yeah, Captain America. It's it's like half a good movie. It's OK. Thor, the first one, it's like it, it, compared to the, the recent one is, is a masterpiece. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of Love and Thunder. It was a kind of a messy first fade, but then you lead up to the Avengers and it's just like, oh, yeah, like knocks it out of the park. What's the plot? I don't care. It's you have all the Avengers on screen. No one had ever done that. Yeah. And and then DC's like, we got to put the Justice League on screen now. We got to do it now. We got to catch up. This whole idea of let's catch up to Marvel. What does that even mean? Like your business is not impacted by them. I've never understood that from a business standpoint. Like. People are going to pay to see this regardless. Like, I don't have any allegiance to Marvel or DC. I don't, there's a lot of characters from Marvel I like. There's a lot of characters from DC I like. Like, one of my favorite characters is a Swamp Thing. <laughs> like, but yeah. I also really <laughs> enjoy the Punisher. It's like, I don't have allegiance. I just like a good story and a good book. That's all I care about. Yeah. So well, this and- idea of catch up to Marvel never made sense to me. It was just, if anything could be said about this Snyder verse that happened, it was, the business side took precedence over the creativity side. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I want to push back a little bit on the timeline there. Like, I think that incentive to catch up really kicks in with Batman v Superman. Yes, I think yes, that you're Man of Steel, yeah, I, I especially in the lead up to it, because it, it was well in development by the time Avengers 1 came out. I think that it was the limited success of Man of Steel. Like, it made its money, but it wasn't the numbers they were hoping. They were hoping that Man of Steel was going to be the Dark Knight, but now in this post-Avengers world. It came out one year after Dark Knight Rises. Right, exactly. Everyone, it was implied, it was meant to take place in the same universe, kind of, because you see the Wayne Enterprises satellite, and that was Mm -hmm. the logo from the Dark Knight. They just transplanted it there, and they said, maybe we'll combine them somehow, but that all kind of went away and they had changed it for BBS. Sure. But Man of Steel was produced by Christopher Nolan. There was this vibe that they wanted to do sort of the same kind of like bleached out aesthetic. It's, you know, it's not all Snyder in that regard. Like that was also part of the Nolan versus Batman movies. In Apparently they're ways. good friends, Nolan and Snyder. So, I mean, those elements kind of make sense. Goyer's working on the scripts like that. That all kind of makes sense. Like we're creating this bigger world that theoretically could have been this franchise and people were hoping that this would be a good paced introduction to the dc world with some actual love and attention going off of like this new era of higher quality superhero movies like of actual money going into it with real special effects and like not afraid to be comic booky in a lot of ways i think a lot of people were excited for this movie And then it just didn't do as well as they wanted. And then you can see the pivot to be, this is what I said in the quote, like, let's get Batman in there. Let's like start setting up the Justice League stuff. Let's get all that locked down because we're we're way behind on this thing. But 
it didn't have to be that way when Man of Steel first came out. It, it could have been them slowly introducing their like flagship characters because like yep. they know they've got like a solid Batman if they need it in the form of, of Christian Bale. And that's like the biggest problem, I think, with this whole Snyderverse or even just Man of Steel is that if you can't even get Superman to carry his own movie, then you've got serious problems mm-hmm, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like that's a big, big problem. here. It's been established at this point that Zack Snyder has expressed not really hate, but a lot of disdain for Superman. Like mm-hmm. somebody asked him, I think it was at a Watchmen panel. Somebody asked him, would you ever do a Superman movie? And he just bluntly said, no. It's like yeah. he <laughs> he does not like Superman. And that's if you listen to the film rescue episode of Man of Steel, which is, oh, my God, it's four years old at this point. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, I just I, I could just feel my hair turning gray. I mean, it's literally the same for us for the another pass episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I just turned 38. I'm almost at the halfway point of life. I'm, I'm almost there, man. Yeah, in that episode, I went into like a book report about Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. Zack Snyder is a well-known Ayn Randian objectivist, which if you read into her philosophies is completely the opposite of what Superman stands for. Yep. And that is the biggest problem. He doesn't like Superman, never wanted to do Superman, But Warner Brothers said, hey, we'll give you all the keys to our hottest cards. If you go do anything you want right there, that was mistake number one. (laughs) He took a finely tuned Ferrari and ran it in a destruction derby. (laughs) It's like a terrible monster car. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, man, this really does not crush these cars very well. Wow. That's really where the problem is. Like you gave the wrong character to the wrong guy. Yeah. But that said, prior to this movie coming out, there was a lot of reasons to be excited about it. Like, yeah, like that in first retrospect, trailer was that, was that really first good. trailer is really mm-hmm. good. But I was actually talking with um, comics writer Josh Dysart, who we've occasionally had on our show. Somebody asked him once about that first trailer from Man of Steel. And he said, I think it's a trick. I think that first because they use the music from Lord of the Rings when Gandalf dies. It's the same music. And he's like, yeah, I think that's a trick. And, you know, sure enough, you watch the movie. That's nothing like that. It's. It's nothing like that. Well, right, exactly. Like in retrospect, we can see like all these things should have been red flags, but it didn't feel that way prior to it because 300 was a huge success. Like, are there problems with 300? Innately, yes, because the source material is also kind of interesting <laughs> as a as a piece of art, but shouldn't be like a definitive take on Thermopylae. No. Yeah, I mean, it's hit completely historically inaccurate. And also, um, if you actually read into the history of the film 300, the United States military was showing that film to soldiers during the invasion in Iraq in order to psych them up to go out and shoot people. It's called image training. Child soldiers are made to do that in uh, war-torn nations. Our government used that film as propaganda to psych up our soldiers to go shoot people. Yep. And and that kind of... It's explains. gross, I know, but the, our government did this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and like that, this that, is it's a it's a comic book movie about Spartan warriors, but eh. but that just is the seeds that then would get to all the later stuff that the, the Watchmen. Would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Watchmen's like such a weird one because like the it's also a, a muddled movie. Like there's so much of the cinematography that bugs me, just like the way that like characters are sped up and are able to do these like superhuman things in a piece that's like explicitly about how they're not <laughs> superhuman. Super yeah. It, but it's also at the same time, it's so slavish to detail from the comic that it can't be that bad. Slavish visually, but tone wise and thematically and morally, it's the opposite. Right. It's a really weird piece. Like it's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. The changes in the story, the ones that people tend to point to are actually the things that I don't really have a big problem with. Like the biggest problems I have are entirely the way things are sort of depicted. Like, yeah, you get to the same frame, but it doesn't quite work. And Rorschach like, is portrayed as being the coolest guy in the world. Isn't he right. a racist? <laughs> Isn't he like the symbol for the KKK and the Watchmen TV show, which is really fucking good, by the way? The TV show is really good. And it's really good that they take that. I would generally argue that he probably was racist, but it wasn't like his big character defining trait. Maybe it was the homophobia. <laughs> the character is fucked up, like for sure. But yeah, like, yeah, but I would say that none of those individual vices are the issue with the character. It's just a big collection of problems. <laughs> a lot of people are pointing to like, oh, they took out the squid. I know the reason as to why that was changed. 
the screenwriter of the film, David Hayter, who also voices Solid Snake in the Metal Gear Solid games. For those who don't know, he is a screenwriter and he still works to this day. He worked on that show Warrior Nun on Netflix, which first season, it's okay. Second season, pretty damn good. Go watch Warrior Nun. They just finally got a third season. Thank God they rescued it. He was talking about why they changed that on another show. The day he went in, he was going to originally going to direct Watchmen. And the screen test of ray stevenson rest in peace and ian glenn as two characters from it they're originally going to be cast and they got changed out for other actors he shot the screen test when he went in to pitch the script to the executives of warner brothers to direct the film it was september 12th 2001 ah yeah and so yeah. he just sat there and the, they just sat there in the office of the executives and they didn't say anything and uh, i think it was david just went let's just go to lunch <laughs> i understand why they changed it i get it it was a day after 9 11 it's like we don't want to do this story about a terrorist attack on new york that wipes out half the town i get it i am totally okay with them changing that and also it would be very hard to explain why the squid is there because it's very ingrained in the structure of the comic yeah. trying to explain that like good luck like you, oh, yeah. you, you need a nine hour movie which is why the tv show is better you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at <laughs> sorry the for this. show is, is a sequel, it's not an adaptation. It's a sequel yeah. to the comic. Sorry, anyone who was like tuning in for Man of Steel for this like big diatribe about Watchmen <laughs> because I can't resist this one. <laughs> what I was going to say is that like the squid, the, the thing about the squid that's so good is that all of the supplemental material leads up to that point, even some of the Hollis Mason stuff, but especially all of the Black Freighter and all of like the background interviews about like different like te like sciences that are being developed because of Dr. Manhattan, all of those things, even the supplemental material with Adrian Veidt, obviously the supplemental material with Adrian Veidt, like all feeds into this like larger meta a story that gets to like the actual plot that's going on behind the scenes but that's all material that you have to like stop and actually read because it's all prose or like there's a, a marketing pitch for like the toy line for the Watchmen stuff that exists oh, yeah. in the universe <laughs> which I love or there's like a Playboy article at one point like the prose is all over the place and it's a thing more loves to do but you couldn't explain that in the script of Watchmen <laughs> yeah. Alan Moore's work tends to work best as comics like look at League of Extraordinary Gentlemen they yeah, did the film meditation, which is very not good. Ugh. The comics, they work only as comics. You can't really adapt them. They're still trying. They're still trying to get that TV show off the ground. His work really does only work in comic form. Unless you're talking about his books, Voice of the Fire or Jerusalem, which is back there on my bookshelf, which is a massive slog to get through. My God, Jesus, it's the writings of a madman. <laughs> Yeah, like his work is, it's very introspective. It's very difficult to adapt it. I mean, he does make films now with his friends in Northampton. So it's trying to adapt it. I get why the changes were made, but at the same time, it's like, it just, again, you got the wrong guy. Right, yeah. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. But trying to like say why like we would go into this movie with a more optimistic view than we would have in retrospect. Watchmen's up until that point, one of the best adaptations of a thing written by Alan Moore. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, oh, well, he like didn't do that bad a job. And like he did 300 pretty well. And that was like at least like visually interesting. And like, oh, OK, I can see some cool stuff going on with that. And like Henry Cavill was just in Immortals at this point, which yep. like he looks great in that movie. And it's like very like talk about like every frame yeah. is a work of art. Every frame is a, is a tableau of, a, of, a, of amazingness. Even Immortals movie, is, is an underrated film. It's not a great movie, but it's definitely underrated. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really yeah. weird kind of abstract like God world that you're in. Like it yeah. it feels very much like a myth being told, which is, is cool. It feels uh, kind of like a side story to 300 <laughs> kind of. Uh, yes, I mean, it definitely was being sold that way as well. And it oh, doesn't yeah. make sense. It's just visually and like interesting to look at. And so a lot of fun in that regard. But then we look over here at, at Man of Steel. And I think there are some solid points to this movie. I think that this movie could have relied on a stronger follow up to make us feel better about it. Jesse, so you and I were like messaging about the comic Man of Steel shortly before this. Yeah, the uh, the John Byrne stuff. And it makes sense why they pulled from that, or at least why Snyder pulled from that. John Byrne is very Republican. <laughs> and uh, we were saying that his version of Superman, while that story that he wrote is fun, he portrays Superman as a cop. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did, I say, did, I, did, did I say cop? I meant pig. Uh, 
it doesn't feel like traditional Superman. They have since thrown that story out of canon, which was a good decision, in, in my opinion. It's very, very 80s. Yes, it feels like a product of the time. Yeah, Reagan era Superman. Yeah, but I do really like the era that that ushered in, the post-crisis Superman era, which in a lot of ways was them going from like, all right, let us make this as dryly Marvel in a specific sense, like the vibe of Superman is much more like a Marvel character. And we're going to make it much more generic 80s superhero comic with as little like superfluous weirdness as we can help it. And then over the course of 20 years, like getting to like the early aughts kind of era when they started like kind of playing with the timeline, adding in slowly all of this Silver Age nonsense, like getting a version of Kandor, like even the Pocket Dimension Superboy, I've, I've said is like it's an incredibly <laughs> Silver Age concept in a book that is anathema to the Silver Age. Yeah, I've always said that DC stuff is better when it's weird. Marvel stuff is better when it's grounded. DC is better when it's odd and out there and weird. Like my most of my favorite characters, Swamp Thing, the Doom Patrol, John Constantine. When it's weird and out there, that's when it probably functions the best. Yeah, you can do weird with Superman, but then you look oh, yeah. at these movies that this trilogy that Snyder made, they're not really weird. They're kind of like grounded a little bit. Kind of. Yeah, which is, of. <laughs> is fine for a pilot to a Superman franchise. Uh, like if you look at the pilot to the Superman animated series, it's extremely like bare bones in terms of the weirdness of the world. And structurally, it's really similar to this movie. The first third of it is just on Krypton. So like, we're not really dealing with Superman until really the very end of the second episode and mostly just the third episode of that three part pilot. There's a lot of precedent for that kind of like launch to a Superman platform. If the next movie was like, well, let's start throwing in some weird shit and then we'll keep on throwing in some more weird shit. Season one of Supergirl was kind of like soft connected to this movie. There were a lot of like hints at it. They never showed Superman's face, so they didn't have to like commit to it all. Like there's oh, like yeah, costume details. Right, yeah. yeah. And I don't want to say I would get rid of Tyler Hecklin because I, I love Tyler Hecklin. I think he's been amazing. He's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's my favorite Clark Kent up to this point. His Superman I, I really like, but like specifically like Clark Kent, especially Clark Kent as like kind of embarrassing dad is the best. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's also appropriate we're talking about Man of Steel now because just recently we had our casting for the new uh, mm -hmm. Superman and Lois recently. We had our new castings, which great casting like you're yeah. getting an unknown lead actor to play superman which is what they did with chris reeve and you're getting the marvelous miss basil <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're getting great choices like good solid choices apparently there's been fan art already of him as superman i'm like oh yeah perfect he looks well, just like him well I, well obviously People because are saying he, he does look a lot like henry cavill which is kind of odd it's like henry cavill <laughs> de-aged by like 15 years no <laughs> no what he really looks like is a doing like one of those like face fusions of henry cavill and oh, tom yeah. welling <laughs> it's yeah like people uh, that make the perfect batman by comparing <laughs> kilmer and keaton and clooney and it's, it's like yeah combine all of them together and you have the perfect batman like, right. All right yeah yeah like maybe a bit of, of chris reeve in, the, in like him being like a little bit leaner at least as far as i can tell well he's supposed to be a younger superman right right it's but i'm just saying in terms of like this like fusion of all the supermen that we've had before <laughs> yeah i think the new the, the superman legacy film is supposed to take place in a world where there's already heroes that have been established like the green lanterns are already around batman's been operating for a while so it's like he's the next one that shows up Kind of. I think that's is the plan, which but, is probably better because like, we don't need another origin story. And I'm thankful that they're just kind of being like, you know what, origin? Pff, fuck it. Screw it. I agree. I do find it strange just uh, as a concept to have a character show up on the scene with established superheroes and be Superman, like as opposed to like Hyperion or the center, you know, like <laughs> uh, I can see it being like he shows up and it's like, oh, yeah prove yourself and he starts out as the underdog <laughs> in a sense to being the leader of the justice league i can see that yeah as an arc for a character that's a good one if that's how he gets his name that would be cool but <laughs> yeah not that yeah maybe that no what, what does the s stand for hope you know it's like it's not an s it's like oh, shut up <laughs> <laughs> all right let's actually get into the the movie itself yeah it, finally I, for all you still listening <laughs> So I, I do want to start with, like, addressing some things that I think are positive about this movie, because part of it is that with Flash coming out and the Snyderverse being kind of dead and it's been a bunch of years since the last time I really looked at it and I've never hated this movie watching it like I don't get as bothered by some of the lost potential here as I would ultimately because it's a false start and we're getting a new start. It's not like we're ruining that potential. I would say the new start would have been the Zack Snyder's Justice League, because if you watched 
his version of Justice League, it's kind of a soft reboot. If you just jumped in there, you kind of sort of still get it. Which is why this movie just feels like so unconnected to the rest of it. Yeah, it, it feels like extraneous material that you don't really need. So I wanted to I'll just start with I actually like the look of Krypton. It's not perfect. I wish it was more colorful. In the another past episode, I was like, oh, why can't jor armor be green? Like, why can't it, you know, like looking like the like the Silver Age kind of style for him, even if they're doing the new like look for the character? This uh, was this was a time frame in film where every movie looked like this. Yeah, but like you, you look at the like, Science Council, though, and they at least look fucking weird. <laughs> it is weird. I mean, I do. I mean, that it looks like H.R. Giger was working on this or something. It's like it, it does feel odd. It feels alien. Which yeah. I, I appreciate. Which is good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like some of the design choices in this. It's it looks interesting, but I agree about the color. It's mm-hmm. so just drab and gray and ugly. It's like, but it's realistic. Like it's like does re- I look outside my window, I see green trees. Like <laughs> I, I don't I don't need everything to look like this. Um, and it really does kind of become painful to look at for a while because your eyes get bored of it. I know that the Superman lives, the Nick Cage one probably wouldn't have been a great movie, but it would have been fun and colorful and over the top and like interesting to look at. Like, and we did recently get Nick Cage and as Superman in the, oh, in did, the Flash yeah. movie. Well, sure not well, CGI deep face, deep fake version. <laughs> <of the cows. laughs> look, I understand putting in all these different references and all these different CGI versions of characters, but hey, Warner Brothers, spring the extra million to get these actors on set for the day, <laughs> please. <laughs> Nick Cage still works and is still alive. OK, just get him on set for the day. Yeah, and he absolutely would do this. Like, his career is entirely about doing this kind of weird shit. Yeah, he wanted to do it. And it's like, they just put him in. They just said, yeah, can we use your likeness? It's like, uh, all right, fine. Yeah, they even have the deepfake files, because if you've seen uh, The Unbearable Weight of Remarkable Talent, like, they've got a young version of Nick Cage in there. <laughs> unbearable, weight of, unbearable, unbearable weight of massive talent. A oh, massive talent, pardon me. You know, the word salad one that created the meme of Pedro Pascal, like smiling. <laughs> yeah, it's that one where they're yeah. high on. Are they high on like mushrooms or something like that? Uh, acid. Acid. That's it. Yeah, high on acid. <laughs> so Krypton, like lots of things to enjoy about that. The H.R. Giger comparison is great. I was noting the like the tentacle kind of structure for like the Phantom Zone that sort of like pulls them in and has like these like electrical effects, like really cool effects in that regard. Yeah. Heavy Brainiac vibes on that one. Also, yes, like, oh, my God, can we fucking just finally get the Brainiac movie? I've been saying for forever. Like, that's... Snyder would never allow that. Too silly. It's, never it's not even that different from what we got. <laughs> it's never happening. Dude. <laughs> Don't, instead of terraforming, he's minimizing a city. That's all I get. That's the big change. Uh, God. Also, can I just point out that a lot of the fans like to defend this movie as being like, but it's a science fiction version of Superman. It's like, yeah, but the science is bad. Right. And uh, and also Superman has always had a sci fi element yeah. to him. On oh, top yeah. Of but like terraforming isn't where you screw with the planet's core. Terraforming is where you pump greenhouse gas into the atmosphere to make it hotter. Like what we're doing right now with our planet, this is terraforming. I just heard recently that Texas is now one of the hottest places on Earth, not in America, on Earth, it's like 125 degrees down there in Texas. It's hot. Yeah. Like, that's terraforming. That's all it takes. You don't screw with the planet's core. It's like, so yeah, the science is bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, they mean, just need, could... they just needed it to create a catastrophic world event that Superman has to stop. It. Right. Yeah, it was MacGuffin. You could probably make an argument of the core stuff if it was like, well, we're trying to make it more like it's not terraforming it. It's crypto forming it. Like if we're trying to make a Krypton, you know, like um, recently in the X-Men books in planet sized X-Men, they actually terraformed Mars. And that was like this like really cool sequence where all the mutants are aligned in using their powers for all this. So like one of the things that Magneto uses his his magnetism powers to pull an iron asteroid from the asteroid belt and they destabilize the core and then add all that iron to the core in order to increase the mass so that it'd be comparable to Earth's so that the gravity would be functional for them to live on and for an ecosystem like their own. Oh, whatever. That's like, that cool. was really cool. Like, Is that the, it, is that the John Hickman run of uh, X-Men? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing. Like like I said, it's like Forge plans it. Magneto does that. Storm obviously is doing stuff with in terms of like creating an atmosphere around it. Other mutants are like adding moisture to the planet. Iceman's creating the ice caps. It's 
this whole team sequence to step by step launch a dead planet into being an Earth-like condition and talking out how mutants could terraform a world. And that that was really cool. You could argue that they would try to do that, but they'd have to find a way to get that mass because, like, yeah, Krypton should be heavier than Earth. Like, that's always been, like, a part of, like, the science of yeah. Superman. Well, yeah, it's like it's, how, it's why they don't fly. Like, you know, it makes sense. Right. So if they were doing something where they were like, OK, yeah, we're destabilizing the Earth and we're going to be pelted by asteroids as they have this magnetic pulse that brings in iron from all over and like other materials so that the world can increase in size to be like Krypton. Again, they just didn't really they were just like, we need the MacGuffin. And it's just like, oh, it's doing this thing to the planet. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was yeah. made more explicit in the script as to what they were doing. But OK, <laughs> <laughs> is David Goyer a hack? Because most of the stuff he works on is like comic book related. I don't see him. It, what was the last like creative thing he did that was original? So his uh, his film works. His most recent was Hellraiser. Before that was Terminator Dark Fate. And then. Oh, this is not good. That Batman is, v that, Superman and Man of Steel. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I did like that new Hellraiser. It was, that was pretty good. I liked it. It was surprising. I mean, yeah, considering that, all it, the. It's all IP. Comes, yeah, it's all IP there. related. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the work of a hack. Yeah, because then I'm like looking, oh, yeah, he was attached to Foundation and was attached to Krypton. <laughs> like, I've never watched yeah. Foundation. I've heard very mixed things on it. I, I've heard mixed things, too. But uh, those books, those books are like unadaptable. They take place over thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Goyer has a mixed bag in terms of qualities of putting stuff together. Like, I don't blame a writer initially coming up with we need MacGuffin for having that in the script initially. It's then you go and research and figure out how the science would work for the whole thing. Famously, when working on Star Trek scripts, they'll often just write tech because then they have science consultants that'll be like, no, it would work this way. And this is what you would call it and all those kind of things. Tech the tech so the tech can work. Right, exactly. They would literally write that into their scripts. Like, and then we start the tech yeah. in order to make the tech. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just there. To It's like a lot of those scripts are like plug and play. <laughs> it just makes shit up. What was oh, that? Right. What's Be that? What's that Voltaire song? The H the USS makes shit up. <laughs> <laughs> well, because like when you're trying to figure out like what the flow of the story is, all you need to do is say like what kind of situation would occur. And then someone else could be like, oh, and it would kind of work like this. And you fill in the words that way. Yeah. And that's what the terraforming thing should have been. They just like had this idea of like, all right, third act situation is this. It's going to be this thing. It's going to impact Superman here and it's going to separate the others this way. What do we call it? Fuck, it's terraforming. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> and they should have done more. <laughs> That's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Let's try to find more positives. Yeah. I would say a big positive. I like Henry Cavill as a choice of Superman. Like, if nothing else, they found a good Superman. They really did. They did launch him into the stardom he has now. Questionable, though, all these movies are. He's good. I just wish that they gave him a script worthy of yeah. his talent. <laughs> yeah, they really did him dirty. <laughs> so stoic all the time. And I don't see Superman being like this. He does smile a couple of times. And if, that was a big criticism. It's like, why doesn't Superman smile? He does smile a couple of times. He does. But he always has that furrowed brow that looks like a giant mountain range on his forehead. It kind of drives me crazy, especially in BBS, <laughs> where it's just like, oh, God, dude, don't you have any other facial expression? Because yeah, you look well, at him in like Man from Uncle or Mission Impossible Fallout, and he's like charming and he's seems fun to be around. It's like just. Yeah, he certainly had a charm that they didn't utilize enough. Like most of the emoting of Superman in this movie is the flashback stuff, which only once is actually Henry Cavill, like a college age version of himself. Everything else is like a kid of various but ages. But he's still somehow the same size. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> just mess, mess up his hair a little bit. It'll be just fine. I, I thought they did. A, he was slouched enough. Like when, when he's in the car, he doesn't like look that jarring. It, uh, it's only when he's like out that he like kind of, you know, yeah. still Superman. <laughs> that brings up a point that I absolutely just checked out of the movie, which was the death of John Kent. <laughs> that was the point where I was just like, yeah, I'm out. Oh, man. Zack Snyder hates dads. I put it like there. There you go. I rest my case. <laughs> It's, it's firmly said at this point that Zack Snyder really doesn't give a fuck about ordinary people. <laughs> like every single one of his movies, like ordinary people are like the least important thing in his films. But it's weird because like his Dawn of the Dead, which we're going to be covering tomorrow on Split the Difference, where you compare originals and remakes, that's considered his best movie because it's about normal people. <laughs> right. Living in the world. <laughs> Living in the world. And it's like, oh, look at that. When you actually have people that can emote and give you good performances, it's like you get a lot out of that. The movie itself is questionable. It's very post 
but yeah, like there's things to like in that film, but then you get to like 300 and all the Spartans are just like godlike and then sucker punch. Like none of the characters take any damage when they get hit. Watchmen, all the characters, they seem superhuman, even though they're supposed to be normal people. Then you get to those DC movies and it's like, he doesn't give a shit about normal human beings. He does not care. When you see the world engine like slinging people into the air and slamming them into the concrete (laughs) and then you see that giant gaping hole in metropolis and they're just standing in the middle of it like not reacting to it it's like he really just doesn't give a shit except in like maybe the abstract like jonathan kent does have this like role in it he's meant to represent the kind of like the two fathers jor-el and john kent like the the father on earth and the father among the stars. Right. And he's very much that like that good American, good old boy dad. But it's the role he represents more than the character himself. He does recommend letting the kids in the bus die, though. Yeah, he's like, F them kids, man. They don't need you. Yeah, fuck them. <laughs> yeah, fuck them kids. <laughs> dad, what about the kids? F them kids. Yeah. They don't matter. <laughs> and by the way, going back to the whole destruction of Metropolis, do you know why BBS takes place 18 months after Man of Steel? No, why? The justification they gave was because they needed time to rebuild Metropolis. That's a bullshit statement because that doesn't explain why it takes 18 months for Batman to begin his hunt for Superman. And it also doesn't explain why Superman didn't go forward to Congress to explain what the hell just happened. Because by the end of the movie, the humans have no idea what the hell just happened. Like, they have no clue. (laughs) Like, for all they know, Superman caused the destruction, so they have no idea. The actual reason is because... The United States invaded Iraq 18 months after 9-11. BVS is a battle on two fronts. The war in Iraq, the war against Afghanistan, the war against Lex Luthor and Doomsday, the war against Batman, and Superman, the heart of America, conflicted, is caught in the middle of it, not sure what to do, which directly makes Man of Steel an allegory for 9-11. What if Superman was there to save it? Well, he fucked it up. What the? yeah and that's why i really despise this movie in many ways i know this wasn't going to be a bitch fest but when you think about the amount of right-wing stuff that snyder shoves into his movies he can say he's a democrat all he wants he keeps putting right-wing shit in his movies he can't help it that's so that's so (laughs) wrong-headed you know where the better version of that comes from the boys the boys in the comic <laughs> right. where they definitely fuck up 9-11. In the comic, they try to stop 9-11 and they fuck it up. They bust onto the plane, kill the terrorists, and then they go, hey, does anybody know how to fly a plane? No? Fuck it, we're leaving. And one of the planes hits a tower and the other one destroys the Brooklyn Bridge. So it's a parallel reality where 9-11 wasn't really prevented, but they still fucked it up. That's why this movie has such a gross feeling to it. Everyone said, why does it look like 9-11 at the movie when that ship is crashing into all those buildings? Because it's 9-11. It's 9-11. Yes. I hate to have the apologist moment right here because... (laughs) Somebody has to apologize for this. 9-11 imagery when this movie came out was already extremely dated. It's even more dated now. But... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It is coming on the tail end of when every movie had 9-11 imagery. Yeah, like Star Trek and Darkness came out, I think, a month before this. And that right. film and it's just is like, also 9-11. And it's a sequel to one that also had weird 9-11 energy going for it. Like, yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah, a lot of movies work. Why did people think that made their movie better? Complete destruction of everything. <sighs> because it was the biggest, most important event for a lot of people. And so <laughs> it's sort of like the thing that they want to like reference as a way to express their emotions about it all and know that they can like directly relate to other people in the audience by way of being like, hey, do you remember this like horrific thing that we all witnessed on TV together? Let's reference it so that we can like trigger those same emotions in our piece. I I can understand that. But at the same time, like I'm not trying to sound like an asshole or be the ultimate cynic in the room, but the number of people that died on 9-11 is infinitesimal to the number of people that died in 2020 from COVID. Yeah. Yep. COVID was a bigger destructive force. Yeah, I mean, there and was that was absolutely point. preventable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Like, there was a point where it was like a 9-11 a day, though, in terms of yeah. lost oh, lives. Oh, yeah, like on planet Earth, that was just another day. Yeah. Oh, that was just another day. Look into every other country around the planet that's going, going through war-torn problems right now. That was just another day. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, yes. And again, in, in I'm not scheme. trying to sound like an asshole. It's just I read the news and I see what's happening in the world. That's just the way it is, you know? But immediately, all the right-wingers, like, 
I used to work as a, a personal trainer. My boss was a massive Trump supporter. And when he saw the attack on 9-11, somebody asked him, he's like, what's going to happen now? And he's like, what the fuck do you think's going to happen? We're going to war. This guy was a military guy. And he was like, yeah, I want to go to the desert and shoot people. Fuck yeah. Like, he was that kind of guy. That is the audience for Man of Steel, I think. It's certainly part of it. There's a very heavy crossover between Snyder bros and right-wing supporters. Very heavy crossover. Absolutely for the most extreme fans of this movie. Like I, I was saying, to, you were trying to get to an apology. What's the apology? <laughs> so, no, the apologist part was just that there was a lot of 9 11 imagery at the time. So it wasn't like it was like that unique that it was doing it. And it's frustrating, but like it's also understandable that it existed. It was dated at this point. I mean, it, it, it's, it happens in history with film. It's like after Vietnam, we had a lot of Vietnam films. You know, after the Cold War, we got a lot of Cold War spy movies. It's like it's normal to adapt that stuff. I get it. But you don't adapt a real world event like this and put it in a context where it's supposed to be, quote unquote, fun. It doesn't work, you know? Yeah. And it's Superman. Like, I shouldn't be feeling miserable when I walk <laughs> out of the theater. Right. If, if they had done it where he ultimately stopped it all, that would be a different element there as well because it's at least superman being that power fantasy yeah and he could have that's the thing but every single time people say like well he could have stopped it and all the fans of these movies they say well it was his first day as superman like not an excuse <laughs> yeah well and, and like the structure of it is also not really playing very well in terms of like getting away from it. It, it revels in the the imagery and like languishes on those shots way more than it had to. Like yeah. when we did the Another Pass episode, I was saying like, well, the fight should have not started in Metropolis. It should have ended in Metropolis in a way that's similar to Invincible, where it's like, oh, look at what our punches are doing. Look at like the, the scale of destruction that happens because we are as we are and they are insignificant compared to us. Like that's an interesting, logical approach to it all like that's getting into the miracle man concept of like if you have a fight of superhumans it's going to be real fucking bad for anyone caught beneath them yeah having as much imagery especially before we even get to the fight makes it even worse it was crazy that michael bay was doing a better job with like the hero trying to avoid <laughs> casualties <laughs> like, oh my god optimus prime is always getting more beat up especially in the first transformers movie because he's trying to avoid humans and Megatron is able to take advantage of that. And in this movie, we don't really get a lot of that, especially not in the Metropolis fight. There's more of that going on in the Smallville fight, which is why I typically think the Smallville fight is kind of the high watermark of this movie, minus like design stuff that I do want to get back to at some point. <laughs> yeah, people say like, oh, nobody died in Smallville. It's like, no, 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 their airplanes could crash in the streets. People definitely died. <laughs> yeah, at least like he's very clearly trying to like stop everything that's going on yeah, and he he's does, having a hard time. He does try to save some people. He does try to actually do something. But then you get to the whole world engine thing and it's like, oh, we need to throw this thing into the world engine to make it disappear and go away. It's like, but I'm going to fly across to the other side of the planet in order to take out a giant robot in the middle of the ocean that's not hurting anybody. It's like, well, shouldn't you do the other thing first? Because <laughs> that's like attacking the city where all the people are. Right, yeah. Yeah, there's no reason as to why Superman can't do everything here, but here's another thing that we, we were talking about this case. This movie has a fetish for the military. Mm -hmm. Zack Snyder and oh, Michael yeah. Bay love to do the same thing. I work in the film business. I do film and TV work. For those who don't know, whenever you have the military involved in a film, you get military funding from the Pentagon. So you get access to vehicles, weapons, uniform, personnel. You get access to locations because the military is there. And that's something that Zack Snyder loves to do. He loves to have the military in his movies. This film and BVS, like the military is like there all the time. They're not in Justice League very much, but they are in these first two films, almost to the point where it's a detriment to the movie because it begs the question, why are you here? Superman can do all this stuff and you're doing nothing. You're just here to inflate the budget. They're there to give Martian Manhunter his cover, sir. Oh, Is that right? <laughs> They're there to make sure that he's in the film. Uh, all right. You know what? Let's, let's talk about that one, because like rewatching Man of Steel today oh, and like having that like, oh, he's supposed to be Martian Manhunter. He's not supposed to be fucking Martian Manhunter in this movie. There is no way. <laughs> I brought that up when we did the, the film Rescue of Justice League. I'm just like, so he's been around the whole time. Huh? Yep. 
Wow. And not doing an anything. You didn't help at all. <laughs> there is one scene specifically where you could say that this like indicates that he might be the Martian Manhunter, which is when Lois Lane is explaining how the thing would work in terms of like the Phantom Zone thing. The general is the first guy to like catch on what they're talking about. And it's like, oh, that kind of could be you arguing that this is secretly John Jones. However, the rest of it doesn't fucking make any sense. Like, yeah, because in the interrogation room, he can see through the glass, but you can't tell he's an alien. I mean, even if you argue his shape shifting is strong enough to like bypass that that whole thing, everything else doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah, this, like yeah. This, you, you you were gonna let the whole planet be destroyed by doomsday, and you weren't gonna lift a finger. Okay. I mean, even just his knowledge of how to interact with aliens and so forth is like really weird. Like the character just doesn't; it's not supported by any of his behavior in this movie. It's just another thing that's there because hey, I remember that. Like that's another thing about a lot of Snyder stuff is that the the references and stuff it's kind of dumb. I've watched some interviews with him and I think I've watched an interview, but he was talking about Watchmen. He just seemed kind of like a deer in the headlights, like lights are on, but no one's home. Like I'm not trying to talk bad about him on a personal level, but he just seems like I referenced this earlier on case. I said, he's an NFL linebacker that somehow became a filmmaker, which I think kind of speaks to his general stance on like what kind of things to reference, what kind of metaphors to put. No, very it's, exa- it's exactly. And that's why I tend to be more forgiving <laughs> of his personal politics than I am of his fans politics. Like he's got exactly the same kind of like moral complexity of I refer to him as like a prep school philosophy major, like someone who yeah. is like, man, you got to read Ayn Rand. It's so fuck. It'll change your life, man. Bro, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> If I understand people that really have that same thought process, Ayn Rand, the fuck you, I got mine crowd. I believed that when I was 15. I'm almost 40 now. I don't believe that anymore. It's better to be a decent person and just try to help everybody else around you. The fuck you, I got mine crowd tends to be right wing voters, Trump supporters and Snyder bros. That's the fucked up thing. The first time I saw toxic fandom, like, oh my God, they will not stop. It was when Force Awakens came out and everyone was giving shit about Ray being like Mary Sue and all that bullshit. And it's like, they were like, the movie sucks. And it's like, it's just a carbon copy. Fuck this movie. It sucks. When did Snyder show up on the scene with Man of Steel? A little bit before that, but. Exactly. uh, Yeah. And that's where they started. And it never has stopped. It's never stopped. They keep going. They keep going. And then when his version of Justice League was basically, you know, shuffled off to the side when he left the project due to the death of his daughter, all the fans were like, release the Snyder Cut, release the Snyder Cut. And they were like actively bullying people at Warner Brothers to do it to the point where they're bullying people off of social media and doing like these heinous things. And he never spoke out about it. If anything, he used it to his advantage. It's like, that's why I'm not so apologetic to his personal politics. It's like, you're using this toxicity to your advantage. And I'm glad he got his version released. I did watch his Justice League recently for prep for this. It's not bad. It's okay. It's pretty good. I got a lot of stuff that I like. It's a good looking movie. But the dickishness of his fan base is just like, God, guys, go away. You got everything you wanted and more, and you still don't stop. I really have a hard time letting this stuff slide. I really just can't let it slide. It's so just gross to me. Like, be fans of things. Be happy that you have stuff. Like, I think it was Jay Bauman from Military Media said, let the media you love enhance your life, never define it. And that's the problem here, is that they wrap their personality around this one guy. That's the thought process of a cult. It's weird, it's creepy, it's manipulative. Guys, it's just Superman. It's nothing that important. It's really not. Well, and that like cult kind of stake on it, like makes it kind of reductive in the long run. Like look at the cast of this movie versus look at the cast of Justice League. Like Justice League, aside from the, the actors who are being cast to be the Justice League, which are a mix in terms of like their actual like popularity prior to those movies coming out. Um, like 
we're getting a smaller universe for them to like really live in. Like there's fewer, like really cool standouts that are just like, Oh, that's fucking wild that they're in that movie. Like you look at this movie, Christopher Maloney has a big part in this movie. He's it's a part that like doesn't need to exist because it's part of that whole military jingoistic thing, but that's yeah. all right. All right. Lawrence Fishburne as Perry white. It, it was probably funny. when he's going to try to knife fight for and I'm just right. Yeah. Like, You're going to die real quick, dude. <laughs> there's a good button at the end, but at that point he has unloaded an Uzi, then, then his sidearm <laughs> and then he's pulled out. <laughs> like, and she didn't even flinch, dude. She right. didn't even blink. It's like, although I will say she is absolutely gorgeous. That actress. Oh my god. Oh god. I love that woman. <laughs> Isn't she in the Flash for like a yep. like half a second or something like that? Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Like so many other people in this. I mean, again, like Kevin Costner, Harry Lennox as the general. Like he's such a that guy actor, but like he's been that guy in a lot of fucking things. I got to meet him once, actually, very briefly. I got to meet him, and I got to meet Martin Sheen in the same day some like PSA that they were filming and he was like working as one of the lighting guys. I don't know why. Just like it was, they were at the Gaylord hotel in national Harbor and they were filming as something with Martin. Sheen. I think this is right after Charlie Sheen had gone to rehab again. And so Martin Sheen was doing a PSA, I, I guessing as assistance to his son. And Harry Lennox was on the crew working, doing the lighting for the thing. And I had to deliver the gear and I talked with him for a bit. He's a super nice guy. And I was, at, I asked him, I was like, yeah, you're supposed to be in the, the new Superman, right? And he's like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so nice guy. Martin Sheen is also super nice. Yeah, like he just, yeah. this is a stacked cast. I love this cast. I just wish they had better stuff to work with. Sure. I mean, like, is it weird that Carla Gugino is the voice of Calix in this movie? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, that's right. She is. Well, I mean, she was in Watchmen. I, I get why she would be in it. Like, yeah, but, I mean, but you just have so many people where you're like, oh, but shouldn't they be given a lot more stuff? No. OK. A lot of people that work with Snyder, they say he's really nice. He's really a, a joy to work with. He lets actors do whatever they want. He's a he's a super sweet person. Like, I'm sure he is. I mean, I've heard nothing but positivity being like so many directors come off as complete dicks. Like, look at Joss Whedon. (laughs) It's like all (laughs) that giant can of worms that we're not going to open. But yeah, like apparently he's a very, very nice guy and a very personable and people love talking to him and love working with him. He brought back Ray Fisher for Rebel Moon. Like he's resurrected his career after Warner Bros. tried to stomp it into a grave. So he loves giving actors a chance to shine on screen. I just wish they had better scripts to work with right yeah much and that's kind of getting back to like the the weird mixed bag that this movie was i mean like again we're, we're not in the snyder cult wave at this point we we're not at the point where we are building to this like just cgi fest that ultimately would be a lot of, of people are still looking at superman as either the brandon ralph version or the christopher reeve version right so good cast interesting designs. One thing I wanted to bring up that I thought was really cool was the nanotech relief system that the Kryptonians use for their communications. That I think is so cool, especially if their vision works differently than ours, because like TV screens, especially CRTs, but like TV screens in general, rely on our eyes being bad, which I always yeah. <laughs> think is like so. <laughs> what do you think? Most people have to wear glasses these days because we keep staring at these things all the time. Yeah, I mean, like the whole concept of like having frames of movement in any kind of system like film is that our eye doesn't actually see things perpetually. It has gaps of vision and you're able to trick it into thinking that movement is occurring because our eyes are shitty and just aren't able to process these things. There are animals on Earth that couldn't look at a screen and not just see it as like flickering pictures until we got better and better refresh rates on things like octopuses, for example, have better eyes than we do, at least in terms of like frame rate. So it was only with the breakthrough into LCD high def with like, you know, 120 hertz, like level, like refresh rates that they were able to interpret it as movement as opposed to just static images that they were seeing like flickering. (laughs) I can't wait to watch my brand new 4K TV with my pet octopus. But on that (laughs) note, like for a Kryptonian, yeah, sure. They may not be super on Krypton necessarily, but like it's an interesting direction to be like, well, yeah, they didn't develop the same things for the same purposes. They have their own versions of things that work totally differently, but for the same objective. Yeah, it's alien. You know, it makes sense. Like they they Mm -hmm. really do hammer home that he's an alien. He's from an alien world. It's not the same. I appreciate that. Like that it's, it's very appropriate. Like I think the, uh, the John Byrne man of steel story, they go into that. Like he's not of this planet. He's really not. Yeah. So I appreciate the effort to do that. But at the same time, it's like, you may not have been born here, but you grew up here. I'm reminded of um, the first Spider-Man. I think I referenced this in my man of steel pitch when Spider-Man at the end of uh, the first Sam Raimi film, 
Willem Dafoe says, I could be like a father to you. And Spider-Man goes, I had a father. His name was Ben Parker. It's like, I'm a superhero, but I have a normal father. <laughs> like, I think that this movie really needed him to choose one side or the other. And that's another problem with the movie is that the character of Superman doesn't have an arc. He never makes a choice. He's fairly static as a character. Like, things happen to him, but he doesn't affect or choose anything. It's like... Why yeah. is he why is he Superman now? Because Jor-El told him to be. He didn't actively choose it. Jor-El said, "You should do this." So, you guys are aware of trickle-down economics, correct? Yep. <laughs> and yes. and how it do, and how it doesn't work. Uh right, what is, yes. <laughs> what does Jor-El say to Superman when he's getting ready to go out for his first flight? You will give people a, an ideal to strive towards, and eventually one day they will join you in the sun. No, they fucking won't because they fucking can't, asshole. <laughs> I don't know if I want to like <laughs> compare that, that that much to trickle down economics. It's the Ayn Randy an idea of he's oh. he's more powerful than everybody else, and no one else can ascend to him. But Superman, like the the reason he's called Superman as opposed to Alien is that he <laughs> is that he's supposed to be like a human, just it evolved, um, you know, a million more volt. advanced version, yeah, right. Superman. Yeah. Because like early ideas were that Krypton would be the future as opposed to an alien world. The thought was that, yeah, humanity could achieve this and that he would be the show the way character. That was the original Joe Schuster, Jerry Siegel idea, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and like like that's, you know, like that's why the first issue of Action Comics says like, how could he do these things? And they try to go into the science of it. Like, oh, eventually we might be as evolved as ants to lift 50 times our body weight and, and shit like that. So I, I think that there's always this element of like Superman is the model that we should follow in and that in some regards that will be innate to our society advancing to an appropriate degree. So I don't think it's automatically trickle down economics, but I do see the point you're making. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> the idea of like Jor-El saying like, you're going to also, I pointed this out on the Man of Steel episode. Like, so they sent him to earth because they said earth is an intelligent species. It's like, well, wait a minute. Wasn't the probe ship that you sent there like from 10,000 years ago before we evolved? to actually do that with this yeah whatever again whatever the script requires at the time is what they will do that's yeah i did like 80 bullet points literally 80 bullet points where these are the things that don't work in the movie on that episode so if you want to hear me get shitty drunk and go ape shit crazy go listen to that episode. <laughs> it's particularly angry yeah you know it's funny they miss they miss a golden opportunity to have the reason humans look like Kryptonians be explained by the fact that we could have just been a colony of Krypton that has like devolved. Oh yeah. That was supposed to be a thing in his canceled justice league sequels. You know what the idea for the, um, Themyscarans was they were ancient Kryptonians right. that didn't know that. Oh, that's so f- that's annoying when it's like the specifically the Themyscarians. I personally subscribe to a fanon in the DCU that Daxamites, Kryptonians and humans all are from the same root species that colonized the galaxy at some point. And that it sort of explains why when the White Martians fucked with humanity, like it fucked up their ability to have superpowers, but connects them to the whole fact of like, oh, it's where the Kryptonians have similar like organ placement and things like that and why they're like human like species out there. It doesn't address the issue of like, well, what about Zeus and Poseidon and those gods? Right. Yeah. It gets a lot weirder once you start. Again, it doesn't make sense. And then, right. you know, you know who the new Batman was supposed to be? I forget at the moment. So go. <laughs> it was supposed to be Superman and Lois's son. So he's rich and he's powerful. <laughs> he's a perfect man. He's Howard Rourke from the Fountainhead. There we go. Continuing this whole he loves Randian to exploration. He this shit in his movies. Yep. <laughs> and a lot of the Snyder fans are like, oh, it's so close to canon. It's so visually close to canon. This is totally different. None of this is in the comics. Like, I'm fine with changing stuff, but saying the Themyscarans are like ancient Kryptonians, that is not in the comics and makes no sense when you really sit down and think about it. With James Gunn changing things for the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, like, I'm fine with that because who the fuck gives a shit about the Guardians of the Galaxy? And that's the point. Nobody cares. Change everything you want. Doesn't matter. This is Superman. There is a standard you have to follow. And that's why also I don't like the fact they took out the John Williams theme, but it really wouldn't fit here. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it would have been so awkward to see human bodies slamming into the concrete while hearing that thing. Oh God, it was so weird. <laughs> I, I mean, on that note, uh, let's, we should probably mention the music. I uh, like, the music while, is great. I'm, I'm not a fan, not a fan. 
I knew you weren't. But I actually think the score works well enough for this movie. And I think it works fine as part of a larger score. I do think that we need like a better, like true Superman theme. But there are some really good energetic bits in the score that I think works really well. Yeah. You watch Black Adam, correct? Yes. Did you mm-hmm. notice at the end with the Henry Cavill cameo that they played the John Williams theme and not the Man of Steel theme? Yep, yep. <laughs> Very <laughs> slick, guys. They really just chucked that thing in the bin. They're like, yep, bye. After Snyder's stuff is done, they're like, yeah, let's get the fuck away from this stuff and just not even acknowledge it. They barely even acknowledge like the Justice League movie in Aquaman. And I don't even think they really reference it at all in The Flash. Like They never even acknowledge it that it happened. I still haven't seen the flash, well, but they, it is they, wild that that would be the case, considering that two of the characters only know each other because of the Justice League movie. <laughs> you know, they reference it. They kind of reference it twice. Kind of. They do go back to the attack on Metropolis, which is a weird place to set. That. <laughs> Why would you go there? <laughs> Just, but anyways, the music for what the movie is, it's appropriately scored. Like his first flight, for example, is like it, yeah. it's a fun. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah, like. There, there's some really good moments in there. And like I like a lot of the tones are good. It's just we're missing like a really strong like here's the the point theme for Superman, like the equivalent to the John Williams score. Although I would say these are better than like the Marvel scores. Marvel doesn't even have a score. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a score and it's not a jukebox musical. <laughs> Unfortunately, like they didn't do a Kanye power drop in this movie, which they very easily could have, <laughs> as was the style of the time. <laughs> The only theme I can think of in the Marvel Universe is the Avengers theme. That yeah. dun, 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 that's the only one I can think of. There's a there's a few what others. Like Iron Thor Man's has one. Theme? Iron Man is just ACDC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, for the first movie, and then they lost the rights. I think after the first one, I... yeah, he shows up with ACD playing in both two and in Avengers. It might be after that that they lose it. Oh, that reminds me. Going back to the whole military fetishism thing. Marvel, they lost their ability to have the military in their movies. You know why? Because the military was not allowed to be right in the Avengers. <laughs> no, it's because S.H.I.E.L.D. is a higher form of power than the U.S. military is in the Marvel Universe. And they said, yeah, we're supposed to be at the top. And they pulled their funding. It's fiction, guys. Yeah, I, I, it's not even real. I really wish that movies that had U.S. military funding had to have a prefix a on their titles. And yeah, yeah the, the U.S. Defense Department presents. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, like whenever you see the military in a movie, they really should say this film brought to you by the Department of Defense because right. it does feel a lot like propaganda. And I would even say that most of Snyder's movies feel like propaganda. I mean, a lot of fucking movies. Snyder's movies, yes, but like just a lot of fucking, like way more movies than Michael you expect. Bay. What else would fall into that? Well, obviously Top Gun. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Top Gun. Oh, my God. But there's a lot of movies where it's not necessarily all about the military, but the fact that they'll have like military scenes is usually because they got some money from the U.S. military and yeah. it gets inserted that way. It's out there a lot. I also think that that should be the way for football games. It should be the the U.S. Department yeah. of Defense presents the NFL uh, because holy hey. hell. Hey, you're possibly right. I'm not saying like I'm not saying they should <laughs> be possibly the football right. Works. <laughs> they have jet flyovers for the fucking Super Bowl. OK, absolutely. They should be brought to you by the- they're pumping money into it. Like that's like I'm not making something up right now <laughs> they do <They're laughs> absolutely funded it's one of the most expensive sporting events in world history they're absolutely partially funding it they yeah. absolutely are and this might help people remember that when they're looking at this whole like why is the u.s military always failing its audits and by that i don't mean that it's like spending money in weird ways i mean they can't account for where they spent the money like oh, we, we, we paid recently? for that movie we paid for that movie just <laughs> Like, didn't they lose minutes. like five billion recently? How do you just misplace five billion? Like, right. What? Like that. That's what we're getting at with this whole thing. Where like they're spending so much money. It'd be nice if they could at least account for where they spent it. That That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I know this is not a political podcast, but the recent fights to not shut down the government. We didn't get like our student loan forgiveness that got taken away recently by the Supreme Court. Fuck all of you. We didn't get any like new infrastructure funding. We got Increase spending for the Department of Defense, even though we're already higher than like the next 20 countries below us. And we got a new pipeline. That's what we got. And you'll be happy about it. (laughs) And you'll be fucking happy, asshole. You're living in your car. Yep. Yep. Uh, 
Right. Anyway, so uh, so I'm just saying that, like, <laughs> hey, you know, you know, every empire is supposed to only last about 250 years. We're almost there. Uh, <laughs> when you're paying for your bread and circuses, like, it'd be nice to just be honest about where the bread and circuses are coming from. And if we're going to have those things in these movies, people should just be aware of it all, because it is kind of creepy just how much they're putting it in there. I don't mind Superman teaming up with the U.S. military to deal with an alien invasion. Like for a long time, I was saying like, hey, you could finally do a decent Superman movie following Independence Day, because I always was saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if in the 90s they made a Brainiac focused movie where it looked like the alien stuff from Independence Day and had Superman with the special effects of Independence Day, where like the alien ships didn't look that bad. Like you could make a convincing flight, like fight in the air with something like that. And hey, that would make sense for some military stuff. And this movie is pretty close. Like, there's a lot of, like, Independence Day parallels. Like, Zod oh, appearing yeah. on TV. I was like, oh, right. This is, like, very much just, like, how Independence Day worked. The beam going down into the city. It's like, it's mm-hmm. just like Independence Day. Yeah, that's the attack part. But I mean, like, the actual beats of, like, the alien approach and, like, oh, oh it's actually yeah, an alien the, movie. The countdown. Yeah, yeah. Like, countdown. this War of the Worlds kind of. And actually, on that note, the fact that the world engine's a tripod, like, this, like, War of the World kind of component to it all, like, isn't bad. And fuck, man, like, Superman plus War of the Worlds is so goddamn good. There's a comic they did in 1998. They put out a crossover book where it's Golden Age Superman dealing with radio broadcast War of the Worlds. And it was written by Roy Thomas. And it's fucking awesome. I think I brought it. I think I might have it here. Yeah, it's a one shot. It's it's really it's really fun because like the aliens are are powerful and Superman's powerful, but neither are like quite so crazy. And it's this like weird world of like, what the hell? And like, it's two different alien groups and people are like scared of both as a result. <laughs> like that easily gets updated with an Independence Day style lens. And you're not too far from what this movie is. Yeah. It's just they didn't like cement it in ways that would be really kind of interesting and, and beyond just like disaster porn. I would only agree to this if we get a shot of Superman, like Falcon punching one of the Brainiac clones and saying, (laughs) welcome to Earth. That's the only way I'll agree to this. (laughs) That's the other issue with the movie is that there's no stakes. I pointed this out, and I think Seth Decker, my co-host, one of my co-hosts, we said, why is it that neither Superman nor the Kryptonians are taking any kind of damage? Like, there's no blood, bruising, broken bones, nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand, like, a human punching a Kryptonian, you're not going to hurt them. I get it. But a Kryptonian punching a Kryptonian, you should see something. Yeah. And there's nothing. There's one moment when he's, like, dragging Zod across, like, the edge of a building, and he's wrecking the fucking thing. And I'm like, he just gets up, and it's like, there's not even a scratch. It's like, well, that all tension is diffused. Like, the only yeah, thing like- I have, I feel sympathy for is all the people that are in those buildings wondering what the fuck is going on. There's also the part where they, they go through this whole thing about Clark having to adapt to his, his powers and things. Oh, yeah. And, he's and like then Zod masters it in like 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, whatever the script requires at that time, that's what the logic supposed to be. The end fight has to happen. We got to do this. We need to have them fight. OK. Yeah. The movie actually is playing like very aggressive with canon of Superman, like trying to like deviate in specific ways. Like uh, while they mention the yellow sun, a bigger issue is like the atmosphere yeah. and how it relates to everyone, like them, them breathing that. And that makes it weirder that they're trying to terraform the planet. There's all these like elements to it. It's like, well, why are you doing that if it would work this way? Yeah. Why that would you not ca- want to have powers? Exactly. Why like, would if- you not want to fly? <laughs> and I have a very easy explanation for what could have been that canon, which is just like under Earth's atmosphere, they're sterile. Or yeah. you could do the um, the All Star Superman storyline, where eventually it gives him cancer. Yeah, a- anything, yeah. <laughs> Any- anything, please. Yeah, there's just so easy ways where you could explain it with it not being an issue, or you don't do it, and you're just excited to have superpowers on this planet. I mean, like, certainly they seem to gravitate towards it pretty quickly when mm-hmm. they first arrive for that Smallville fight. Again, that Smallville fight has a lot of things that are really good. I love the fact that the two Kryptonians are way weaker than Superman in terms of raw power, but the, between their armor and their presence on the planet and their military skills, they're keeping up pretty well, and that collectively it's working really well, and that it's his hometown. All of these are things I really like. I just realized something. So if the big dude, I can't remember his name, and Feyora, if they haven't adapted, why are they moving super fast? Yeah, so that's that's sort of the thing what? where, like, I it's probably it. the armor. <laughs> I just realized, oh, my God, how did I miss that one? It, so it's probably There's the armor. no reason they're supposed to move that fast. 
And you could argue that maybe some, like some of the solar radiation part of it all or the gravity, like there are lots of reasons why it would be working. Just it wouldn't work all the way on them. Regardless, we end up in a scenario where they're like golden age Superman versus someone who is like burn era Superman power wise. That fight's really cool. I like that element. I like that Zod is at first fighting in that sort of style. But once he becomes more adapted to our atmosphere, he's able to actually do the flight stuff. But like you could make arguments for like why him being there longer. And like I know in it. They're like, well, he's a soldier, so he is trained to focus on his senses, so he's able to get there. Those are all, like, good moments, or at least, like, explanations for it. Yeah, that was what Seth brought up, is that he was bred to be a soldier, and so he's meant to adapt quickly. That's So you can kind of sort of forgive that one, but it doesn't explain the other two characters. Right. It doesn't explain Feyora or the big dude. And that's why I think that the armors and their technology as the reason for it. And I like in your pitch, for example, you really focus on their weapons. But I think the armor itself also like plays a really good part of that because the armor is designed in such a way that it looks a lot like the Bronze Age Lex Luthor armor. And it would have made so much sense if the progression of weird shit coming from Superman was a world of Kryptonian tech influencing humans tech and going in that sort of direction and starting to open up like all the weird crap that could be out there. If it was just the dry start of a much progressively more insane kind of world, we probably would look back much more fondly. But now we're, you know, several years out from the last real entry into the Snyderverse from the perspective of like a Snyder movie. Uh, And like the movies that are like kind of sort of still tied to it are like diminishingly. So in a lot of ways, (laughs) it's it's like so tangential at this point that it's, kind of its own thing the flash has kind of thrown everything out of canon isn't barry like caught in like the batman and robin universe now or something like that (laughs) i spoilers for case on the case have you seen it nobody i haven't seen it yet okay uh, so it's more uh i think so i was very confused about that part because i was like i don't know where he popped out well he didn't pop out he he it's certainly an alternate timeline (laughs) with the multiverse stuff going on like yeah when you get into multiverse, it's like, eh, fuck it, anything goes. Eh, whatever. It yeah. doesn't matter. Is I this mean, canon? Is that not canon? Sure. Sure. Snyderverse still exists. It's just kind of over there in the yeah. corner by itself. I mean, because like Jesse, as you said, we always have some kind of version of Superman out there. Like, if nothing else, you have the comics. And the comics are constantly reinventing themselves as well. And I have a feeling that when the Superman and Lois show wraps up on the CW, they're only getting, I think, like five episodes next season. Uh, Ten. 10. They're wrapping up the show. And then by that point, Superman Legacy will be in theaters. Right. So we will have another Superman just right away. You also have My Avengers of Superman. Yeah. So we're, we're constantly getting Superman material. So like, I'm curious to go back to this movie once Superman Legacy comes out. Yeah. To see how it feels. I really need to be hopeful. I was thinking about the other day, like, how do you open a new Superman movie? Remember in All-Star Superman, the story of the girl that was going to jump off the building? She was depressed. and That is the first scene. And he rescues her and he hugs her. That right there got the whole audience on board. This is not the Snyderverse. As far away as you could possibly (laughs) go. Because they parodied that on the boys with Homelander going like, yeah, jump. It's like, that is Snyder Superman. And then you look at how they made fun of the Justice League with the dawn of the seven and Snyder's like laughing at it. It's like, dude, they're making fun of you. <laughs> like, you do miss the joke. <laughs> and this is why it's like, well, it's hard to necessarily get that mad because like he plays along with it. And like, I just don't know him personally. So I don't want to like. Uh, but I just, I, he does, when I see him in interviews, it just seems like he's kind of dim. A lot of people say like, oh, his movies have such great visuals. All that shit is a green screen. Anytime he has to film like an actual scene with actors in a scene, very rarely is the shot composition very unique. It's very kind of standard shot, reverse shots. He doesn't do any complex camera moves. It's typically just let the CGI guys handle the shit afterwards. 300 is all plate shots. Yeah. It's all plate shots. That's all it is. Watchmen, most of his plate shots. Army of the Dead was filmed entirely on a green screen. Why? It's a zombie movie. Like, it's just a zombie movie. Why is it a green screen? Well, so you can seamlessly integrate Tig Notaro into it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God, that is like the most hideous looking movie. I swear to God, I hate (laughs) I hate it. The shallow depth of field drove me crazy, which, by the way, the tail end of his Justice League. I'm pretty sure that was all filmed on the same location as Army of the Dead. It's shot with the same cameras and the same lenses. You can kind of tell it's that very shallow depth of focus. It's all close ups. 
You can just see it's like, yeah, we're tacking this on just in case I ever want to come back. <laughs> You're not coming back, dude. <laughs> Looking at this movie, though, I will say, and again, kind of like going from the perspective of like, what was it like to be excited for this movie beforehand versus then how we felt afterwards? We do also have to remember the previous movie was Superman Returns, which oh god has news, things news. to like about it. The plane sequence is really cool. People talked about that for days. But in terms of muted colors, fuck, <laughs> the, the movie itself has this like sort of like faux uh, Norman Rockwell kind of feel to it with this, this like kind of amber kind of hue to it all. Yeah. But there are at least colors except for on fucking Superman. Oh it's God, like, his suit is so muted. Yeah. So <laughs> ugly. So at least in this movie, his cape is red. <laughs> so that's a good start. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Like there's a blue filter in so many scenes. There's like all this stuff going on. And Somebody did a YouTube video that said, what would it look like if Man of Steel was in color and like all the colors, they got rid of the desaturation and they made the colors pop. And I was like, wow, it looks really good. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this was a time frame when every movie looked like this. This kind of, we're getting to the tail end of this post 9-11 feel where it's like everything's just drab and desaturated like the jason bourne movies all look oh, like yeah. this like oh my god those movies are hideous now that's the thing is that these are all watershed movies spiraling down and everything just eventually just looks like this yeah yeah i mean it's certainly iterated it's not like upon. it's anybody's <laughs> fault it's just what was popular which is weird because i think in 2010 scott pilgrim versus the world came out one of the most yep. colorful movies ever made and Bond at the time. And Bond is <laughs> But well. it's a cult classic because it was just the wrong movie for that era. Yeah. That reminds me, Skyfall is also very post 9-11s. Like, it has that kind of brutal, or even like, the, maybe like the first three of the, like, Casino Royale. Yeah, I was going to say, like, all, all of the Daniel those Craig. Those three yeah. feel very, like, post 9-11, you know, the spy agencies are there to sort of be paranoid of everybody around you. It's like... yeah. Although Skyfall is actually a good one to bring up in the sense that that movie specifically was kind of breaking away from the grim, dark post 9-11 kind of vibe that had been coming in from Casino and from it Quantum makes of it Solace. It a personal story about Bond. Right. It, a lot of people remarked that, oh, hey, we're getting back to a Sean Connery style kind of James Bond. Like we're getting a classic Aston Martin. We're getting more gadgets. We're getting more of like a conventional villain. It's a I, lot of member berries. Uh, yes, but that is the one that's coming off of two movies at this point. And that, I believe, came out the same summer. Or was it this year before? Like, either way, we're in like a very similar kind of time frame. I want to say it was 2011 or 2012, because it was like four separate movies did the whole, oh, the bad guy got caught on purpose. 2012. 2012. Yeah. So it was that. And I think the Avengers did the same thing with Loki intentionally yeah. getting caught. But it, it was fall of 2012. And then this is coming out in the spring of 2013. So we're not really talking about like massive difference in timeline. My point is that that was a movie where they were like, OK, we did that a couple of times. Let's get out of it and get back into the things people really love about the franchise. This movie hadn't learned that lesson yet. This movie was just like, well, we've got better CGI than we used to. We can do Dragon Ball Z type fight sequences if we really need to. Um, <laughs> My friend, Hope, our co-host, is going to hate you for that because she hates when we say like, Dragon Ball Z is just fighting. We know it's not all fighting. I, I love Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> we know it's not all fighting. We know. It's just funny to say it. Yeah. I just mean that like the anime-esque kind of like more exaggerated fight sequences that first became popular in uh, Western made live action movies with The Matrix. There's a, a direct line in terms of like what they could actually do in terms of fight choreography with superpowers coming from the Matrix films to this. And people wanted that. So there was a lot of enthusiasm about that. And when you got the guy who did like a cool fighting movie, the like 300, people were excited about that, too. We all complained that Superman Returns was too boring, that it wasn't interesting enough, that the stakes were too human level. Like, ultimately, it was like, OK, we're creating a new, we're creating a new island for real estate schemes uh, and you're going to fight Lex Luthor <laughs> all on, weekend. Lex, you can do better than that. <laughs> but the point is, like, let's do a Zod movie. Let's do a big movie like that. Let's do like big action, big destruction. Let's have like, yeah, when superheroes fight, there's collateral damage because like the Ultimates was still fresh on people's minds where it was like, the, oh, yeah, the Hulk fucking killed like hundreds of people in New York the one time he rampaged like ah it, didn't they actually release them himself in order to give the avengers something to fight part of that was to quote unquote give them something to fight and part of that was so that he could get revenge on his his ex did the first suicide squad movie copy that plot because that's the same plot <laughs> <laughs>
it's wild when it's like, oh man, Mark Millar has really shaped the the nature of the comic book film industry. Oh God, uh, there's been a whole like tirade against Mark Millar recently. I've been seeing like a ton of tweets being like, man, we hate that guy. I'm like, I, yeah, I agree. He's an asshole. I mean, I don't need to go too dark, like deep on that specifically because I think that Mark Millar has a mixed portfolio as well. But the the big thing is that we're talking about a movie that felt like a product of its time, but it was already feeling dated by the time it hit theaters and taste had started to change in very specific ways by the time we got here. And this movie hadn't caught up to that yet. It had been 12 years since nine 11. It's like, God, we're still doing this, still doing this. People shouldn't walk out of a Superman movie feeling grim and miserable and depressed. Neither should they walk out of a Star Trek movie feeling grim and miserable and depressed. People walked out of Into Darkness feeling like just blech. And by the way, that's, I think, our first episode for season nine of Film Rescue. You're supposed to be on that one case. So. Yep, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, dusting off my notes. On I that have one. not watched that movie in a long time, and I'm going to get very angry. But, and here's a comparison between Star Trek and, and Superman. Both are inherently optimistic franchises. And also, both of those have a worse taste in your mouth when that is where the franchise is currently existing versus in retrospect. When you're looking at Star Trek Into Darkness from the perspective that we would get strange new worlds. Like, it is a different taste because, hey, there's fucking amazing Trek now that people can easily access. It sucks that, like, series like Prodigy are being canceled and pulled from their networks. But that's the industry. Man, we really don't want to pay our writers, do we? Like that, That's the industry and not the franchise. The franchise is in pretty good shape. And as a result, the bumps in the road feel less damaging. The bumps in the road are just Alex Kurtzman after I ran over him with my car. So... <laughs> If it's Alex Kurtzman, don't threaten me with a good time. (laughs) (laughs) If it's Alex Kurtzman Star Trek, don't watch it. If it's Terry Metalla Star Trek, fucking watch it. It's good. Yeah, I mean, if he's a producer, it's like whatever. It's like he's his name is on all of it, but like executive how, producer I, code for I got a paycheck. Right, exactly. Fail upwards. Uh. <laughs> you know, John Peters, who was supposed to produce the Superman Lives uh, script, is a producer on this one <laughs> by name only because he had his, he's had his name attached over so long. He's yeah. got some kind of rights contract with it he started as a barbara streisand's hairdresser yep yeah if yeah, anyone has upward yeah if anyone has not seen the kevin smith speech about working on the superman list project oh, uh, go check that out it's worth buying the dvd set for an evening with kevin smith volume one just for that there's a documentary called the death of superman lives that was done by um john schnepp i think is his name he got interviews from like cast and crew and everybody that was involved and like all the different designs for the suit and like it would have been interesting. I don't know if it would have been a good movie, but it would have been definitely unique. More unique than I would say than Man of Steel, which if you really think about it, it's a watershed of the post 9-11 style of filmmaking. This is a fairly safe way of making film because it's hard in the opposite direction from Superman Returns. So it's like, oh, that movie was too boring. Let's put in the action. 9-11 movies are popular. Let's put in 9-11. It's just like ticking boxes, like yep. check, 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 <laughs> get Snyder, who will do what he's told by the studio and then give him all the keys to all the best cars and then let him wreck them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, can you do a Michael Bay Superman? And can that Michael Bay Superman be slightly smarter? And I think that's the the big line here for why people like Snyder. He's got the Michael Bay aesthetic in terms of it's the way the sequence is. a little more clever. Yeah, it's, exactly. Bit. Again, it's that prep school philosophy student. He's like, no, this is an analogy for this thing. But that thing is 9-11. <laughs> it's, prep, it's prep school philosophy with very amateur style filmmaking, because I always love to point out the church scene. Oh, God. oh yeah. So did you notice that he's Jesus? <laughs> he's 33. He's in a church and he's questioning what he should do with an image of Jesus behind him in the Garden of Nazareth. Do you get it? Yep. It's and then later when obvious. he leaves the ship, it's, it's yeah, for whatever yeah. reason, it's like yeah. a Christ arms. <laughs> God. Worst part is that church scene, you could just cut. Watching it today, I was just like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. You no, could just totally remove everything. it. And of course, there's the incredible how it should have ended where it was just yeah. like, what if what if instead it was just like, <laughs> It's like, no, let, I should probably talk to someone who knows him. My space dad. <laughs> <laughs> space dad. <laughs> yeah, like what well, you had access to the ship. You could just like go back there. Hey, how did Clark learn how to fly the alien ship? 
I'm assuming Jor-El flew the alien ship, but also it moves. And that that's why it's like, well, it's not in the location that all the Americans know where the Fortress of Solitude is, because that, that's a weird choice. There's satellites what? in the sky that could literally look down and look at the thing. But like, <laughs> isn't it so much cooler to be like, yeah, it's buried in like 20,000 year old ice or whatever it was saying in, in the sequence. Yeah. Like that is such a cooler. This is where the Fortress of Solitude is. Then it's an alien crash ship, like just somewhere on top of a glacier somewhere. Like yeah, you can people can say the Donner movies are outdated. I agree. They are outdated. But I love that design for the Fortress of Solitude. You know, in, in its own way, the Krypton tech for that also very cool. Like, that's a weird part where, like, both this movie and that had very like the Krypton tech specifically was one of the highlights of the design work. Yeah. I mean, it really does integrate the anatomy and the mechanics of Krypton into the story. Like, I get the fact that they tried to make it more sci-fi-esque. And I appreciate that. But at the same time, it doesn't really help the story. Like, the story itself is kind of basic. It's it's just an alien invasion movie. There's Mm -hmm. not a lot to it. It's like, it's a dumb movie that thinks it's smart. Like people that read Ayn Rand. They're dumb people that think they're smart. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that is exactly it. it <laughs> yeah, it, if, and for all the problems of this movie, for all like the plot issues, the bad color grading, the terrible dialogue, this only ends one way, Cal. Either you die or I do. Just fuck you, okay? That terrible line that I will never forget. <laughs> just that means you only one way that's going to happen. It's just well, this only ends one way. Either you die or I do. That's an either or. It's not one way. That's either. Oh, for God's sake. For all the problems of this movie, the biggest problem is a lack of empathy. You don't care. And the characters don't care. Superman doesn't care. There's no <laughs> genuine love in the film. Snyder doesn't like Superman. So Superman doesn't like Superman. So Superman doesn't like people. No one loves anybody in this movie. Yeah. John Kent acts very cold and standoffish with his own son. Martha is in the film, yes, but her scenes are very minimal. Are we sure it's Martha? <laughs> it could be Martha <laughs> Manhunter. <laughs> Martha, why would you say that name? That's what they hinged all of this universe on that scene. Well, that's the whole thing about like all of these movies, which is that there are ideas that are being expressed in this movie. But are they properly conveyed in the actual text of the movie? The idea of Superman being upset that he had to kill Zod. Part of that is that he should have been excited to find his own people. Zod should have been exciting to him. Like compare it with like X-Men First Class, where like the rift between Magneto and Xavier, that's such a strong element there that when they actually have to like face off against each other, that is a moment of like great sadness. That kind of is how things should have been with him and Zod, like where it's like, oh, hey, this Kryptonian arrived and he shouldn't have just immediately known that Zod was a bad guy. It could have been like, hey, it's so exciting that we have Zod here. Zod seems my pretty people. cool. Like my people are back. There's survivors <laughs> of my world. I have felt so alone on this world this whole time. And now look at them like this is great. Wait, what are you guys? Sorry, you're going to do what now? Uh, I Hold on. Wait, we shouldn't allow that. Um, I, I, I Don't make me do this, guys. Don't make me do this. And then Superman fights him and wins. Yeah. And then at the end, when he like has been forced to kill Zod and all of his people have been like stripped from him, like he is truly sad because he is truly alone as far as his species goes and that loneliness that he has felt this whole time on this planet is there, but now he has new acceptance as a hero of earth. Like that's the arc that should have been in this movie. And I think Snyder thought it was. Yeah. Because like, every time that this comes up, people are like, Oh, it's because he's so upset that he killed Zod, the last member of his race. Like, but that's not in the text. Like th- what that is, is a commentary track level, like analysis of it, like an interview describing what that scene looked like. It's, someone who's too close to the material saying this is what it's supposed to represent, but not actually doing the work to have that be in the actual piece itself. That's a thing that the Snyder fans love to point out. It's like, oh, well, he feels upset that he had to kill Zod. It's like, but it's never established. He doesn't like to murder people. (laughs) It's like you see so many times when he's a kid, he's like, this kid had a terrible upbringing. Like he was bullied constantly and treated like dog shit, but he never seemed like he was ever having a genuinely positive childhood. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't he grow up to become a psychopath? I pointed this out on our Man of Steel episode. There's a comic called Irredeemable by Mark Wade, And the character, uh, the Plutonian, is evil Superman. He's straight up evil Superman. 
And it's what happens if Superman grows up in a terrible environment and his parents treat him like shit. He's constantly insulted and picked on. Well, he goes apeshit crazy and destroys half the planet. Like there's a moment when he just breaks out of his prison, goes into the atmosphere and literally carves into the continental shelf his symbol, a giant design of his symbol. And it just like burns away a huge chunk of planet Earth. Like that's this version of Superman. He doesn't seem like he's very happy to be there or happy to help anybody. Like, because the rescuing sequence that's in BBS, that was mandated by the studio because they were like, yeah, why is Superman not saving anybody? Yeah, again, this movie, I I think, hasn't really fallen into that trap as much. There is he does save people, like especially the flashback stuff we get. The oil rig scene is pretty good. And then Lois does have a bunch of lines about it, but they don't do enough with it. You know, like that's that's kind of the thing. Like they set up that his backstory is that he has always felt the need to help people, but they don't really like that's never in his present. The last time we see him do that is the oil rig scene at the beginning of the movie. And then after that, it's not until it's like, well, I better like put on my super suit and go deal with the Kryptonians. Yeah. Isn't the bar scene right after the oil rig scene? Why, mm-hmm. why did he get like scared and run away? It's like the guy was like five foot three. <laughs> Come on, man. It, it is the weirdest scene where it's like the guy <laughs> that they choose. Cause like that's such a great moment where he like tries to shove Clark. He falls back. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. that's, that's great. And yeah, the waitress comes up and she says he's not worth it, but like how not worth it? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, plus, isn't that your job? <laughs> yeah, kind of. I, there, there's a very similar scene to that in the current season of Superman dentist, and Lois. But I can't do a root canal on you right now because I'm having a, an existential crisis. It's your job. <laughs> well, so there's like a very similar sequence in the in the current season of Superman and Lois where Clark goes and confronts someone who is just like a, you know, a near do well in town who does the same shove and doesn't nothing happens because he's Superman and then tries to like get more aggressive and he effortlessly like pins him to the table of this diner that they're at and that's oh yeah that's right i saw that scene yeah and 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 that's basically what should have happened right there yeah (laughs) because it's not it's not even like oh i might accidentally kill you it's like he like he could have defeated him with without even like extending that level of effort this was also in superman 2 right richard lester version i think it's also in the donner cut as well yeah it's it's in both that's where he's depowered when he encounters him and then comes back with his powers at the end yeah which doesn't make any sense in the Donner Cup. It's like, wait a minute, didn't you rewind time so we wouldn't remember? Like, that movie is kind of like stitched together with like bailing wire and duct tape if you really right. break it down. <laughs> I like the Donner Cup, but I, it, it is definitely like, why do the reverse time thing again? It does feel like they wanted to have that moment of Superman going back to Zod being killed. They wanted to have that moment of like, oh man, he's really upset about this, but they didn't establish that he doesn't want to do this. Right. You know, and it's like, plus you just spent like 40 minutes wrecking the entire town. Who knows how many people are dead? Like, and you're not giving a shit about them. This like family of four people. Why do you now suddenly care? Oh, because the movie needs to end. Like whatever, like I said, whatever is appropriate for the script at that moment, that's what they go with. And it's, that's another thing in objectivism is that metaphor is not important. A equals A. It's like, well, what you're seeing is Superman is defending that family. And he really really want to protect them because he's Superman. But yeah, (laughs) you haven't established that because the script is bad. Right. Again, almost all of these either could make sense or would work fine if set up or the idea is fine, but not developed like him saving a bunch of people and killing him and being upset. Those all make sense as sequences if you really needed to do that. But on paper, it sounds fine. Right. But it's just not well set up. You were saying about like commentary track having to like you fill in gaps and like that. That's a common thing with like Snyder and his movies, like this whole trilogy. The justification for why the mother boxes come alive in Justice League is because he says in his commentary when he was doing a watch party before the Snyder cut was released, he said, well, it's Superman's yell awoken the mother boxes. It's like, well, that was never in BBS. Only in the opening of Justice League is that revealed because he mentioned it in a watch party during BBS. So it's like they're almost kind of like retrofitting all the stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. I meant to do that. I swear. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) It's like building a car and driving it at the same time. Like, you didn't have a plan going into this. 
again, it feels like the machinations of a guy that's just not the brightest. I'm sure he's a nice person, but it's just, I have more faith in James Gunn. Here's the thing I will say, why James Gunn was a good choice to take on Superman. James Gunn had a really shitty life growing up. He's been very kind of nebulous about it. He doesn't talk about it much, but he had an alcoholic father. He was actually curb stomped when he was younger. Like a lot of his teeth are actually fake. So he had a really rough upbringing. He's come from really shitty beginnings, working at Trauma, working on crappy movies, you know, grinding his way up to the top. And now he's in charge of the biggest franchises on the planet. Zack Snyder, his mother was a famous photographer and he's always kind of had money. He's always kind of had it on easy street. So he's never really had to struggle too much. James Gunn has something to say. Those Guardians films, they are about human trauma, about therapy, about getting past your own personal problems. What is this trilogy, Man of Steel, BBS, and his Justice League about? What is he trying to say? The only thing I can come up with is, what if Superman was evil? Because the, the I, nightmare sequence at the end of Justice League is like, oh, well, what if he's going to go evil? Yeah, well, what if he cracks? What if Atlas shrugs? But like, that's yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. What if Atlas yeah. shrugs? That's it. Yeah. That's literally all I, he has I, to say. I, and I think with your point, like this movie less so than the others, which is why I just genuinely think this is the best of like the Snyder DC movies, like the, the Snyder helmed DC movies, because this movie actually had an editorial process. Even his Justice I, League? Yeah, from a construction standpoint. BVS is the worst. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> not not the point. The, the thing is, though, like he has never had as much like pushback from the studios in terms of what he was allowed to do just by virtue of the fact that like he was kind of given the keys when DC didn't know what to do, like especially for BVS. Yeah. Like they announced that. What was that? Like 10 movie stretch of things. It was like going to be Green Lantern Corps and Wonder Woman and Flash. Like and most of those never came to pass. So they immediately like chuck that plan out the window when bbs didn't do as well as they'd hoped it is worth noting that another thing that snyder fans defend is that well man of steel and bbs they made a ton of money if you really add them all up and everything after that's been financially failing well yeah because we saw through the bullshit we got burned once with man of steel we're like okay maybe bbs will fix it we got batman in there we got wonder woman maybe it's gonna be good and we saw it was even worse and then it's like well yeah i'm not going back Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It's like, <laughs> I'm not going back again. Like, that's why people stopped going. And now we're at the tail end of the Snyderverse with The Flash and like no one showed up. It failed. These first two movies made money. Yes, BBS made a ton of money. Transformers makes tons of money. You know, it Somehow. doesn't mean <laughs> anything. <laughs> like, who gives a shit if it makes money? So they made their so they made their quota for their taxes for the year. Congratulations. I mean, money is important. Like having a movie that like sells perception. I was talking with yeah. Bob Shipman about this movie, Bob. Perception means a lot. Like Thor, Love and Thunder, and I think it was a across the Spider-Verse, I think are generally doing the same financially right now. It's like one is not very beloved. The other one is. Right. Or when uh, Birds of Prey came out, it made the same amount of money as Ford v. Ferrari. One got mixed reviews and got was said, oh, it's a financial bomb. The other one was like, oh, it's a critical darling, got nominated for awards, and it's a financial success. Like, perception means a lot. People expected Birds of Prey to make a bazillion dollars. And it didn't. It, 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 it's fine. It, I like the movie. It's good. It's not my favorite of the DC movies, but it's pretty good. And it's got it's got charm to it. Mm -hmm. It's more than I can say for the Snyder stuff. It's almost like Harley Quinn pushing away from the Joker, like, ah, get off of me. Like, that's what it feels like. So perception counts for a lot. And people just they saw that Justice League coming down the road. They're just like, no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Well, and, and like the fandom itself is like really like made it very difficult to be even a moderate fan of this property. You're either all in or you're not. Right. You know, and it's it's creepy. Like I said, it's a cult. It's creepy. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning movie, Bob. I was debating if I was going to bring this up. He, he had a point that I actually kind of agreed with at the time, which was like his initial review of the movie when it came out was positive. And then even like a week later, it was already like, actually, I think that I was just kind of caught up in the hype cycle. I related to that because I also came out and I was like excited. I, I told my then girlfriend, now wife, like, I'll go see this again because I think it's actually really like good one. And, and, then and like, you I said, had like, a very different opinion. Yeah. Oh, God. 
we get the same thing case <laughs> we did the same thing because i went to go see that yeah. movie opening night and with oh, my then man. girlfriend and her one of her friends and like i was like oh my gosh this is great then i went home and i thought about it and i was like wait yeah. a second they passed mm-hmm. on which is not weird like the the phantom menace i had the same reaction <laughs> yeah, Pat Oswalt did the same thing. It's like, yeah, go see Man of Steel. It'll turn your pu- your spine into powder. And then, like a couple weeks later, he's like, yeah, this movie's not that great. <laughs> so, it, right, which is why I think it gets more hate than necessarily it deserves relative to the later stuff by virtue of like, well, it we, we wasn't up that in. bad. It's just in retrospect, but also at the time, it felt there was so much hype going into it. It felt more disappointing than necessarily bad. It's also the watershed of the Transformers movies where it's like it's it the movie itself like the sound design it's so loud all the time that it's almost punishing to watch it. Mm-hmm. I've grown to not like loud movies anymore. Something like Mad Max Fury Road. That's a loud film but appropriately loud. There's a rhythm, there's a melody, there's a harmony to it. Like the engines revving and then the guns fire and like the clanking of the metal. Like it feels harmonious at times this is just like boom 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 it's like having two jackhammers like slamming into your skull like i said there's no sense of empathy or joy there was no sense of empathy or joy in the sound design either because it doesn't feel like any one sound takes precedence over another it's just like nope slam it at level 10 on the audio track everything 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 and it's hard to sit through in my opinion it's very kind of annoying and then that world engine starts up and it's just it's like stop. Yeah, I mean compare with like Star Wars, which is actually fairly loud at the at, at specific points. Like even just the original Star yeah. Wars, like the, oh, yeah. the TIE fighter noises, the lightsaber sounds, the, the blasters. But the music, when the music needs to come up, it comes up. Right. That attack on the Death Star, that music going down the trench, it's like, oh man, just like, yeah, come on, man, do it, do it, do it, do it. It's like it hypes you up. Whereas when you get to this movie, did you notice that the Man of Steel theme doesn't really play during the fight scenes? Right. While there are good themes for Superman in this, they don't have a good Superman theme. Yeah. Like, great first flight song. Great, like, yeah. here's here's time mm-hmm. for a fight. There's no moment, though, where we get, like, the true John Williams successor in this whole piece. I've always said, like, they shouldn't have changed it. Granted, you can't really put the John Williams theme into this one. With the regards to the Superman theme, it's one of my favorite musical compositions ever. I love that theme. And it's like, if you're going to do like a remade version of it, it's like, I'm going to propose a, a challenge to you, Case. Rewrite the Star Spangled Banner and don't include anything from the original version. <laughs> can't do it, can you? No. <laughs> yeah, like, that is Superman's theme. That is what it is. That is why John Williams is one of the best composers of all time. That is the theme. Like the Star Wars theme, that is the theme. It's hard to change it when it's so ingrained in culture. Yeah. I admire the audacity to say, we're going to try to do a new theme. We're going to (laughs) fail, but we're going to try. Yeah, I mean, we did an episode on Superman themes and there was an element we were talking about all the different ones. And the John Williams one is so strong and it influences the later ones and ones that are strong that come after it clearly pay homage as much as try to deviate from it. And this one is the one that doesn't pay as much homage to it. It's it's focusing more on the deviation side. Again, Snyder doesn't like Superman. So he's like, yeah, screw that theme. (laughs) Yeah, we we came to the point of where like the better Superman themes have. Like the horns come blasting in at certain points to like to lift everything back up. This one, I love this. I love the uh, this this soundtrack, but like it's more percussion than anything else. <laughs> that's that's Hans Zimmer's thing. He loves. Yeah. It's, it's he like loves so much. Per, it's so much percussion throughout. Like yeah. the the theme of this Superman. It's great in Dune. It's great in Dune, but it does not work here. Well, so in that episode, I brought up that the that the big theme for this movie sounds more like Kal-El than Superman. Like the if you think about the horns in it, it, it you can mm-hmm. almost hear the phrase Kal-El, Kal-El. The problem there is that it, that is the starting point for the story. And we don't get to the Superman part of the story. Well, they never really call him Superman. They, they, they right. Except for one time, like somebody says, hey, Superman's out there. And, they, and Harry Lennox goes, Superman? It's like, yeah, that's what we're calling him. It's like ashamed of its origin, you know? Yeah, it's, it's definitely that like... <laughs> <laughs> that post the original X-Men kind of like yellow spandex, like embarrassed about comic book thing. Yeah. Kind of vibe. Th- thankfully, we're kind of getting away from that because uh, Hugh Jackman is supposed to have the yellow spandex outfit in Deadpool 3. He's supposed to have that. 
they're finally getting it in there on the last right. time he's going to do it. It's like, <laughs> well, about fucking time. It only took you like 25 years. Jesus. Uh, yeah. Another thing I'd also like to say is not only should the military have been putting a disclaimer in front of those movies, all the product placement should have also put a disclaimer at the front of this movie. <laughs> you mean you don't like to go eat at IHOP or was it Nokia phones? Bread and peas Sears. Like, <laughs> Nokia yeah, phones yeah. everywhere. The, the product placement in this movie was obnoxious. Some were less bad. The IHOP is actually not really the worst of it. The Sears one is, the, <laughs> no, is, it is. frankly the worst. Like, yeah, no, it is. Like, yeah, the worst at the IHOP. You go right down there. I'll fuck you. You know, that's <laughs> a fairly realistic scene. Is What's the, thing. the worst? What's the worst? Uh, no, I think the Sears is the worst because the shot itself I was at, is... I was at Nokia. <laughs> it's right there. Center like, frame. He, he flies up and the, the soldiers all look up. But what they're doing is effectively they're looking up at the logo. <laughs> Wasn't there a, a Superman commercial for like Arby's or something like that where Superman like lands in the street and he wrecks the street and just kind of goes, eh, sorry. And he flies off. I could swear there was an Arby's commercial for that, and like Henry Cavill was in it. I don't remember. Uh, I like, where there was. Yeah, I mean, like, here, the thing is, like, Smallville having a bunch of, like, small town kind of, like, oh, big that businesses that have taken over are fine. Like, the, the gas station that blows up is a 7-Eleven gas station, but that's not really called attention to. It just happens to be a real brand. 7-Elevens uh, are everywhere. That's fine. Right. Yeah, like, again, like, I have could, you know, it could be better, could be worse. It wasn't as funny as the Krispy Kreme in the Power Rangers movie. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, where they literally stopped the movie dead in its tracks. Like, that's fucking hilarious. Like, <laughs> like, like the, the way they play that scene and the fact that they got the money for it. This one, <laughs> yes, the product placement's, like, not great, but uh, I guess... They could have justified it if there was a conversation about massive corporate entities taking over small town America and sort of like wiping it out. But instead, it kind of doesn't really comment on it. And so they're not doing anything with it. So it is distracting when we have these big shots of it. Like I said, the Sears one is really, really painful. The Nokia phones are really painful. That said, that was a common practice still is for like the equipment that they get. Like Apple does a fuck ton of that. Every Sony movie, they don't have any Apple products. Right. Everyone's here's a Sony Ericsson phone. Here's another one. (laughs) Who the fuck still uses an Ericsson? (laughs) Apparently only actors in Sony movies. Yeah. Or like, uh, what was it? LG ones in uh, in the Marvel or like the early Marvels, like Iron Man 2. (laughs) Didn't they use a Blackberry in one movie or something like that? Like people Uh, still use Blackberry. The, uh, I yeah, I mean, like there was the big one that stands out to me was an Iron Man 2 with that, that LG wing. It wasn't the wing because that was the more recent one that had the format, but it was that same style phone where like the screen oh. rotated and oh, created yeah, a, a right, T-bone right. shape. I think I had one of those. I think I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, like there's a bunch of like those, those like weird product placement ones. I understand product placement is a normal thing. It's it's uh, I understand it. But when it's when it's like dead in your face like that, it's like, uh... God, it's like, where it's particularly egregious you know like there is an interesting through line to what goes on with pete ross in this movie it's jumbled and weird but i actually rather enjoy the fact that we get him picking on clark earlier then he's the one helping up clark after the bullies are, are like picking on him at the later sequence and then he's on this down on his luck kind of like yeah he's a manager at an ihop but like all right whatever kind of life like there is an interesting story going on with him in that movie, even if he never has any lines. <laughs> well, he does. He does have a little cameo at the wake for Clark at uh, the end of BBS. So, oh, that's a nice detail. I don't think it's, I it's remember in the extended that. cut. It's in the extended. There's a lot of stuff that's added into the extended cut, but which everyone says, oh, it makes the movie work now. No, it still doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it still doesn't explain why Lex Luthor is a raving psychopath. <laughs> I fucking yeah. hate Eisenberg so much. And the the worst part is that opening sequence, if it wasn't Batman, if it was Lex Luthor, would have been so good for, as a setup for Lex Luthor. Like, if instead of it being Bruce Wayne that is, like, witnessing the, the fight in Metropolis. Yes! Yeah, yes. especially if, oh like, my God, yes. going with the 9-11 imagery, if there was, like, dust clouds, asbestos, all that stuff, and that's why he loses his hair, and so we get a Silver Age nod combined with this, like, fucked up imagery. Like, that could have been kind of a fun setup for why this Lex Luthor is so fucked up. But, but instead, it, we just know. get Eisenberg being weird and creepy because he's representing a character from the Fountainhead. By the way, the Fountainhead was the structural basis for the entirety of BBS. So if you're wondering why it's all a jumbled mess and makes no sense, that's the reason. Yep. I hate to keep coming back to this, but it's like, it's so in your face the whole time. It's just like, it's so obvious. Right. And people, and, and because <laughs> Ayn Rand fans are the most annoying when she ended up as an, a welfare queen at the end of her life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Way to stick to your, your, your principles. Right. 
God. Like, and that's another thing I will say is that with regards to the Ayn Rand stuff and the lack of empathy, like people like Ben Shapiro and Rush Limbaugh, people that follow that philosophy, like now that Rush Limbaugh's dead, nobody talks about him. Nobody quotes him. Nobody references him. Even his people that were his fans have forgotten about him because he was an asshole and never did anything fun or interesting with his life. He never had anything positive to say. He just spewed hate. What a pathetic way to live your life. Yeah. I was really glad in the current season of Strange New Worlds, there is very clearly a Ben Shapiro stand in in one sequence. Uh, ah, ah. But it is it is very hard to tell. It's just if you're paying attention to what this character is saying, he doesn't say it exactly. He says, like, facts don't care about your emotions <laughs> uh, is the line that he gives. And it's a Vulcan character saying, fuck your feelings. Yeah, exactly. Facts don't care about feelings. <laughs> um, and I was like, I like that right there. And also, I like that no one's going to pick up on it if they're not aware of like what they're talking about because it still fits the scene and the character still an asshole. Like that's how you do metaphor. Well, where like where it works with the scene, regardless of if you get it or not. But if you get it, there's this extra layer that you're like, oh, I see what they're doing here. Again, this movie could have used a stronger editorial pass in the screenwriting phase in the actual edit, because, man, the flashbacks are all jumbled in terms of where they fit. Uh, Dan Olson has a really good video talking about how, like, if you would just like move the flashbacks into different spots, they would just make more sense. I agree. <laughs> yeah, like I agree, yeah. every single one is like in the wrong spot. Have the beliefs picking on him right before he encounters the Kryptonians have the senses thing, be it, you know, like all these should, are at the wrong locations for it all. But that all said, again, this movie it is, is jumbled. It's uh, disappointing. It was probably overhyped because of the era of comic movies that we were in. We were getting away from the down and dreary, and this is more of the down and dreary. But there was a lot of reasons that we were looking forward to it. And I think in the long run, in the, the canon of Superman movies, there's a lot of misses in there, too. So this is still going to end up being like kind of in the middle of the pack, regardless. It's not Superman four. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, And there's some decent stuff that spawned off of it just by virtue of, again, Supergirl was kind of a spinoff of this movie. From that, we get Superman and Lois and Superman and Lois has the weird desaturated look like crazy in that series. There's a lot of elements that are, are very similar to the style of like a Snyder kind of Superman power set in part because they figured out how to do it in After Effects and got it to be cheap. Like, that's how it all was happening there. And that is ultimately a really good work of a similar kind of vibe. One other thing I wanted to address is that I think that filmmakers like Zack Snyder or Michael Bay or James Cameron, they're not really filmmakers, they're engineers. They structure the shots appropriately so that the people in the editing bay and the special effects department can make it look good. Yeah. Like James Cameron is not a filmmaker anymore. Like he is a tech bro. That's what he is. Like those Avatar movies are basically just animated movies. And he just says, yes, yes, no, yes, yes. And then takes all the credit. The scripts are basic. Yeah. It's, it's just like plug and play, like copy this from that script, copy this from that script, plug, 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 and done. Unobtainium. Unobtainium. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I just, it's my favorite. I swear to God, it's not vibranium. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I think while this movie has a lot of flaws and it has some strengths, it's so middling and frustrating at times and that we're kind of going to want to walk away from it being like, wow, that was a lot of really good casting choices and a lot of things that on paper should have worked really well. And ultimately, what a way to say a lot of nothing. Yeah. But I'm happy to finally talk about it on this show. I am going to say that everyone needs to check out because we've referenced it to death and you should actually listen to the, those episodes. The Another Pass episode that J. Mike and I did on Man of Steel as kind of a soft pilot for the series, as well as the film rescue episode that you did with Seth and, and the crew. And those are really in-depth ones where we go into like how we could have restructured this movie into actually something that's in a bit better shape because this movie had potential and we were hyped about it for a reason. And there are things where you're coming out of it and you're like, God, wouldn't that movie have been great if it was better? Like the fact that we have emotions about it is because it had potential and we can see some of that potential in the end product for it to have been a good movie. And it was frustrating that it wasn't. That's that fascinating but flawed kind of equation that makes a good movie to talk about how you would fix it. Because if it was going to be bad from the start, who the fuck cares? <laughs> I'm going to say I'm not like a super in love with Superman guy, but I do really like the character. I just got the um, death of Superman omnibus. Holy crap. Nice. <laughs> the, death and Return, <laughs> the new printed version. It's longer than the Bible. <laughs> oh, we, we, we are very aware since we yeah, just we did know. a very <laughs> in-depth coverage. It's, 
1400 pages yeah <laughs> so i got that for myself because while the story itself does have issues just it's all here everything like the I, death return everything the good the bad and the ugly the weird side stories <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure someday we'll do BVS on this show because, <laughs> man, did they fuck up Doomsday. <laughs> Good God. Yeah. Why um, does Doomsday have, like, no personality to Abzod? It's the same guy. That's a good it's, question. <laughs> you killed me, Superman. I'm back. I have a response that is a massive spoiler for a thing that is pretty new, so I'm not going to say it. But there was a very easy workaround that they didn't take. That would have been much more annoying or much more interesting. You were about to say much more annoying. <laughs> I know, but I th- that was more annoying the way, it, you know, it, it, more <laughs> annoying where they took it. They could have done something that was much more interesting. A related piece of media has recently done something like that that worked very well. While watching it, I just couldn't stop. Being I know like, what it uh, is. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah. On that note, I think we've wrapped up the, our conversation of Man of Steel. So, Jesse, as our guest, please Tell people where they can find you, follow you, give plugs for everything you've got going on. Okay, so um, I'm on, God, how many shows at this point? We have Jaguar Sharks on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or everywhere you can find. Just look up Jaguar Sharks Podcast online. You can find us. We have wrapped up Film Rescue Season 8 recently. The fact that we've gone down the rabbit hole for eight seasons, my God. <laughs> We're going to be going into Season 9 pretty soon. Our first episode is going to be Star Trek Into Darkness. Case is going to be on that where we basically do kind of the same thing as another past, but we get a little bit angrier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you it's another to, past with a two drink minimum. <laughs> yeah, two drink minimum, yes. By the way, you always like to do on another pass, you always say, our next episode is going to be Highlander 2, The Quickening. We're actually doing it next season, you fucking coward. <laughs> you coward, we're doing it. <laughs> our guest on that episode, comics artist Jason Lennox said, yes, hurt me. I was like, Okay, here you go. There's your assignment. And he messaged me back and saying, I don't know how to fix this. It's like, you asked for it. I actually have a pitch, but. uh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. But I've committed to uh, to saving that for the the, the funniest circumstance that I could come up with. (laughs) Or or when you finally decide to end the show is like, yeah, we're going to do it now. (laughs) Kind kind of. Yeah, like that was sort of the original idea. Yeah. We also have uh, Split the Difference. It's my show, personally, that I run, where we can pair originals and remakes. Tomorrow, we're doing Dawn of the Dead. Appropriate, you know, because, <laughs> hey, you know, another Zack Snyder thing. That's yep. actually still his, considered his best movie, even though it has major problems. So, I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's where a lot of people, like, learned about him. Um, and, and I'll note that I was recently on Split the Difference. We were talking about Planet of the Apes, so... Uh, People should check out that episode. Yeah, it's a fun episode. And uh, we also have uh, Mind Brain Movies. That's Hope's show where we talk about films from a psychological perspective as a sort of cinema therapy. That's kind of off season at the moment. And we have uh, Two Whatever's Way Up. We just kind of chat about random stuff. We just did a whole episode about AI usage and how ethical it is in film and uh, compared it to what happened with Secret Invasion. (laughs) What a catastrophe that is. Oh, God. (laughs) <laughs> and the show's not even that good. Like, it's not even worthy of, like, a long, in-depth discussion. Like, the show is just kind of like, yeah, it exists. Sometimes that can lead to the most interesting, like, tangential bits of analysis. And other times it's uh, a struggle to get through. But <laughs> Also, we do have a TikTok page where I kind of, like, pull out little snippets and I edit little video clips to it. We just had to restart our TikTok page. I was about to ask, was it restored? (laughs) We did. We had to make a new one. Uh, For those that don't know, we had another one where we had a bunch of videos on it, and we had a bunch that went viral. A lot of Star Wars ones went viral. Warner Brothers directly nuked our TikTok page because we pointed out something that they don't like. (laughs) Are you aware of the Wabbit Season episode from Meat Canyon case? Well, I mean, you shared me this, the the whole info on this I, one. I so shared, that's right. I shared that to you. Yeah. So there's a whole thing about Meat Canyon and Wabbit Season and Bugs Bunny is apparently canonically now considered a recovering rapist. They didn't like us pointing that out and they immediately filed copyright infringement against us and they nuked our whole channel. So we had to oh, restart. <laughs> but yeah, we did start up again. It's uh, Jaguar Sharks uh, White T, I think is what it's named as. Jaguar Sharks Network is what we've changed the name to. But yeah, we're so we're slowly re-uploading older episodes and I'll be cutting together new ones pretty soon. Awesome. Awesome. 
Uh, Jim, Mike, where can people find you and follow oh you? Oh my gosh, is Twitter still a thing? I, know, I don't know yeah. if it's a thing anymore. <laughs> Twitter exists. It might even Can't be better it. by the time it keeps on limping on. So, like, it might be in a better space by the time we get back or this episode drops. I'm but. not holding my breath on it. I am on Twitter at jmike101. I sometimes reply to funny tweets and jokes. I might even post something occasionally. Who knows if I can log into my Twitter. <laughs> also, you can reach both jmike and myself on Discord at the Certain POV Discord. We've mm-hmm. Got a, a permanent invite link on our website, certainpov.com. And most of us have links all over our profiles that will direct you over to our Discord server. It's a lot of fun. We, we, we've got channels for all of the different shows. Also, just like a lot of like fun interactions about things like TTRPGs, like what music you're listening to. Um, fun and Games is a backlog of video games that they have recently finished. So people are like posting screenshots of like in screens, which is just kind of fun from a community standpoint. So you can find that and that's a good way to contact us. Uh, you can also find me uh, on Twitter at K sake and you can find me on instagram at quetzalcoatl5 because i'm holding on to that aim screen name for dear life uh, you can find the show on twitter at men of steel pod and i am throwing out there a little bit of a contest that we're going to be running i have a bunch of copies of voices from krypton the oral history of superman that i referenced at the start of this um, we are going to get ed gross the writer of the book on soon we'll have the scheduling announced but if you join the certain POV Discord and you just put a message in the Men of Steel episode chat that you're interested, we will enter you in a drawing to get one of three copies of the book that we I will then send to you. So join our Discord in the Men of Steel chat. Drop that you're interested. And when we actually put the episode out, I will do a drawing live and we'll figure out the three people who are going to get uh, copies of the book. So that that's out there. Uh, I'm going to be dropping that in future episodes as we go get closer to actually getting that scheduled. So that's out there. We're doing a contest. We haven't really done one before. <laughs> <laughs> First time for everything. Yeah, it, it seems like a fun one. If you're a Superman fan and you want a copy of the book, a physical copy of it, because you could also get it on Kindle. I want to provide that for people. It's it's a cool book. It's it's a tome. Uh, it is massive. <laughs> <laughs> But Jesse, thank you for coming on. This was a lot of fun revisiting this movie today. Oh, of course. I haven't watched this movie since I did the Man of Steel episode for Film Rescue four years ago. And I was like, <laughs> I'm never going to ever come back to this. Oh, sure enough. Yeah. <laughs> I can't I can't seem to get away from it because Zack Snyder is the bane of my existence. I really do not like his movies. Like I said, sure, he's a nice guy, but it's just like there's just something about the way he makes his movies that's compelling to me, even though I don't like them. I don't know why. <laughs> So again, thank you for coming on. Uh, I hope for listeners, this was a fun conversation, despite the fact that we gave everyone homework to go check out two other podcast <laughs> episodes. <laughs> I mean, it, here, here's the way you look at it. Man of Steel, that episode is about three hours. Listen to it in chunks. The BVS episode, it's five hours in the Patreon version. It's only about two and a half in the regular version. And then the Zack Snyder Justice League is like, yeah, it's a nice little addendum. Um, I'm happy with that one. I pitched a dark side movie. <laughs> that was kind of fun. <laughs> I pitched a dark side movie that was basically Dread 2012 crossed with God of War. Fight your way to the top, claim the throne. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that, people should definitely check out those pitches because those were, were really solid, fun ones. And our, our Men of Steel, or, yeah, our Man of Steel episode, because God damn it, did I not think this through <laughs> when I named the, <laughs> the podcast Men of Steel. <laughs> Um, our Man of Steel episode of Another Pass is a lot of fun. It is not quite that long. It's about an hour and a half. Um, so it's a little bit easier to uh, to squeeze in there. But 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 both are really great conversations about the things that could have been done to make this movie that had all this hype going into it a, a tighter movie that would have been, a, you know, a, a more solid foundation for what was to come. And it, uh, it sucks that it didn't happen. It's fun to think about it. Uh, I'm glad that we're getting more Superman material. I'd be really sad if this was sort of the thing that killed the franchise and we're thankfully getting another shot so i have uh, faith in james gunn guardians 3 hits so well it's like it, it, it's it's very difficult for it to fail yeah yeah i mean he's used to working with adversity like we said so we're, we're excited about the future of superman productions even if there's going to be hiccups along the road even if max or hbo max or whatever thing they want to call themselves next week uh i refuse it, to call it max yeah <laughs> 
Uh, want me to just start calling Peacock cock? Come on, man. Like, <laughs> well, it also comes from the Cinemax part of the <laughs> of the brand. <laughs> God. You know, even if the state of our ability to access content is constantly getting worse and dumber and things like DC Superhero Girls is being pulled from all streaming services, including your ability to buy it on iTunes really? and Amazon. Yeah, yeah. And like that shit made money for DC. Holy crap. It's that bastard Zaslav at the top. Yeah. So even if the state of media sucks, the franchises themselves in a lot of cases are in good shape. And I'm excited to see the future of the Man of Steel and what what comes from all this. And, you know, maybe like, you know, when, when copyright expires and he's fully in the public domain and people can start making their own stuff, we'll we'll see some additional things and people will start re-releasing all the material that had been difficult to find uh, the way that they do for like the Fleischer Superman stuff. I don't know. It's an exciting future for Superman. Is it only like a couple of years from now that he becomes public domain? Real close. It's the <laughs> Mickey Mouse, I believe, is next year. So we're that's what Mickey like Mouse is like next year. Five that's, years yeah, after that or something. Superman. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Close. yeah. It, it's it's real close at this point. So we'll see what the future brings. But this it has been a fun look back at the past of what was kind of the, the launch of the current era of Superman media. You can still feel a lot of reverberations and everything that has come out since, but we're getting away from that era. And it was fun to go back and look look at it again and, you know, see strengths and weaknesses and all of that, because it's it is a it is a flawed movie, however fascinating from a certain perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to bring up 9-11 so many times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like it's I'm, right there in the movie. It Oh, it certainly is. It certainly is. And <laughs> it's a thing. But yeah, so I am not entirely sure what we've got next time because our production schedule has been real weird since I had a baby. So uh, I wish I could tell you, but we will be back soon with another episode. And until then, stay super, man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is scored and edited by Jeff Moonen. And our logo and episode art is by Case Aiken. Video games are a unique medium. They can tell stories. Immerse us in strange, fantastic worlds. Blur the very boundaries of our reality. But at the end of the day, video games are fun. Whatever fun is to you. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And on Fun and Games, we talk about the history, trends, and community of video games. It's a celebration of all the games we play and all the fun we find within them. And there's so many more games out there. So we hope you'll share in that conversation with us. Fun and Games podcast with Matt and Jeff. Find us on certainpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And happy gaming. Jay Mike, was there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to bring up? Have some kids. No, uh... <laughs> Fuck <laughs> them kids. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.